Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. The show originally aired on the Premier Networks on uh, Sunday, November 13th, 2016. This is episode 1340. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Zip Recruiter. Are you hiring? With ziprecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And by Jira Service Desk. From Atlassian, Jira Service Desk delivers everything your IT team needs out of the box at a cost-effective price. For a free seven-day trial of Jira Service Desk, visit Atlassian.com slash twit. And by Epson's new EcoTank printers with Epson's line of super tank all-in-one printers. You can print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit Epson.com slash EcoTank to learn more. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Remember me? Uh, we talk about tech, you know, computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, virtual reality, headgear, self-driving cars, you know, that kind of thing. The future. This is the show about the present, but it's also about the future. <laughs> if you want to join it, 8888-ASK-LEO is the phone number. Yeah, we still use phones in the future. Yeah. Yeah, sorry to say. Some, some Sometimes we use Skype. In fact, if that's uh, toll-free in the U.S. and Canada, but if you're outside of Canada, you could use the Internet to call. 888-827-5536. It's toll-free, so it shouldn't cost you anything no matter where you call from. Uh, website is techilabs.com. And here in the future... Uh, we talk about things like the new emoji. <laughs> the new emoji are here. The new emoji are here. So the, uh, the, <laughs> the Unicode Consortium is the group that approves emoji. And this is actually a very serious engineering group that, uh, you know, uh, Unicode, if you've been around computers a while, you've probably heard the term. You remember the term ASCII? American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Remember that? ASCII. It was your ASCII code. But ASCII was kind of limited. It only had 256 different letters, which was fine for, you know, our alphabet, A through Z and 1, 0 through uh, 9. And why that even left room with the upper and lower case, that's 52, plus the 10 digits, that's 62. Why that left a lot of room for... Accents, diacritical, you know, marks. Um, even like uh, little glyphs, they call them. Little, uh, remember sometimes, and before, I'm now I'm showing my age here. Before we had graphical user interfaces, in DOS, sometimes you'd make a menu. Do you remember this? You're probably too young to remember this. And it would be, you'd make the menu with like little uh, lines, but they were actually little characters. And they had corners, they had single and double lines. They, and you had, you know, cross lines and up and down lines. And you could make a, a box and stuff like that. Those are all ASCII characters. But really, to be practical, we needed more than 256 of them. Because uh, there's, you know, there's Cyrillic, the Russian alphabet. There's the Japanese alphabet, the Chinese alphabet. There's lots of different non-Roman characters. So uh, we went to Unicode, which is a 16-bit instead of 8-bit representation. That gives us more than 65,000. Yes, from 256 to 600, I'm sorry, to 65,000 different characters. It's like, I don't know what's the exact number, 65,368, something like that. So now we got a lot more room. Simultaneously, as that was happening in Japan, uh, telephone makers there, and this is really pre-smartphone, uh, were putting uh, emoji it's a Japanese word, into uh, their phones. And the emo original emojis were really kind of very uh, Japanese-centric. Sushi and uh, faces and, uh, you know, and very limited. There weren't very many. 
Well, over time, we've expanded, and now we have hundreds of emoji, and they all have to be approved. They can't, you can't just, you know, we have to all agree, right? So Google and Apple and Facebook and Microsoft and all the big tech companies that create operating systems, um, they all have to agree what, you know, what the what character 137 is. You know, if we don't agree, then it doesn't I can't send you an email. So everybody gets together and this is the Unicode committee and they meet and they it's, you know, it's pretty abstruse stuff. They debate it. But the thing that's most interesting to normals are these extended emoji characters and they become very you see them all the time now in text messages everywhere. Not just a, a happy face, but all kinds of faces, all kinds of looks. And, they're, and they've been expanding rapidly of late. Google, for instance, lobbied hard to show more um, work emojis, you know, farmer, construction worker, policeman. And, and, it, and Google said, and you, by the way, they have to have two representations, male and female. Right? Of course. Policemen aren't just men. It's police women. So you have to have both, to be fair. Then we got a little more elaborate on uh, skin shades because most of the emoji were kind of a yellowish Caucasian look, you know. Not, I mean, not the color any human has, but this <laughs> representation of skin, which would be presumed to be a Caucasian or actually originally Asian. So they've, they, they, they now have a range of skin tones from, you know, Caucasian all the way to very dark and and everything in between. So if you have an emoji on your on your modern smartphone or computer, you can you can actually select the shade. And they've added emojis for new things. The dumpling emoji was added <laughs> recently. Well, 59 new emojis approved this week. They get proposals all year long and then they get together. They got together in San Francisco this past week and decided and they've approved 59 New emoji. Now remember, these are global. Emojis have to work in every country of the earth because everybody uses them. Among the new emojis, the hijab emoji, which is the Muslim head scarf. So uh, a person wearing a hijab. Uh, a breastfeeding emoji. Now, this was a, interesting <laughs> because... The, now, the way it works, the Unicode committee doesn't even do a drawing, really. Well, they do. They do a sample drawing. But they mostly, it's a, it's a word description. And then they might give you a sample drawing. And then everybody, Google, Facebook, Twitter, everybody designs their own. Apples are kind of controversial. In the next generation of iOS 10.2, they're going to be very photorealistic. So their eggplant really looks like an eggplant. You know, I mean, it's the avocado you want. You say, give me some. So uh, the, the breastfeeding emoji um, is very difficult to figure out what it is at first, unless somebody tells you, oh, yeah, see, there's a... Because the head is cut off. And the reason they did that, and this is a little strange to me, is like, apparently about 1% of men can breastfeed or something like this. This is what I was told. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know anything about it. So they didn't want to have a head on there to uh, d d denote a, a gender. But the problem is this headless thing that's it's weird looking. And the baby also has a strange hair tuft. So I don't, it's very strange. Don't think it'll be widely used as is. But each, but as I said, each company gets to define their own. There's now a pie emoji. It's about time, right? Frequently requested. There's a pretzel emoji. Now that has two meanings. There's, of course, the pretzel you eat. But it could also mean twisted or complicated. <gasps> There's a sandwich emoji. Oh, this is fun. There's a, a lot more face emojis, including, and they don't say it's the shh emoji, but they don't say the shh emoji, you know, the one where you put your finger. They say just a, a face with a finger over the lips because I guess it's not, in, in, in other cultures, it may not mean shh, but they did put that in there. Shh. There's also an expletive emoji <laughs> where it's an angry head. And uh, and it's got a black bar across its mouth with, you know, exclamation point pound sign and stuff. The description is serious face with symbols covering mouth. Uh, there's a smiling face with rise, raised hand. Hmm. 
saying like waving at you. This is all, you know, it's a, I think people make fun of emoji because, you know, who uses emoji? It's kids. But no, this is really a communication medium. So we need to have a good variety here. Smiling face with smiling eyes and three hearts. Grinning face with star eyes. These are all new. Grinning face with crazy eyes. <laughs> smiling face with hand putting on makeup. Serious face with symbols covering mouth. Frowning face with lowered eyebrows. Smiling face with smiling eyes and hand covering mouth. Well, there's now 59 new emojis. So anything you can think of. You'll start to get those in Twitter and Facebook and then later in your Macs and your iPhones. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. What about this one? Shocked face with exploding head. <laughs> it's That's here, introducing apparently to replace Mind Blown, which was done... In the past, with a shocked face and a bomb emoji. Smiling face with smiling eyes and four stars. Oh, I forgot. You gave me emojis. Angry face. Arr. 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 These are nice. Where do we get these throw boys? I think these they are brand are. new. Yeah, I think they ordered them for this segment. Oh, did they? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but these are not the new emojis. These are the, these are old emojis. I like this one. These are nice. They're soft. And, oh, they're clean. That's why they're nice. They have the, all the other pillows are disgusting. <laughs> Do you want to play with this a little bit? No. It's nice. I. Uh, but anyway, the 5D2 is yours, and the and the uh, 2470 is yours, and you may not have these emojis back. Let's not get a breastfeeding emoji. That's. <laughs> is that weird? What? Oh, Michaels has them. Nice. They're probably a throw boy uh, knockoff. <sighs> yes, you get them on the MacBook, of course. You know, it takes a while to get the new emoji in. Um. You know, in order to, so for instance, if uh, you know, people can even put uh, emojis in the chat room, I don't know if that's frowned upon, but because this is on a Macintosh that you're looking at the chat room, um, it just takes a while, right? Exactly, Scooter X, yeah. So, but you could, you can throw emojis in there. Um, you can um, do it on your PC. There, I see, there you go. There's some emojis, people are throwing them in. Crying face. Oh, Scooter X, that one didn't work, I guess. We could talk about it. I think, you know, emojis have a legitimate reason for existence. Yeah, I don't know what chat... This is X chat? Yeah, it's X chat aqua. I ask, the poop emoji is not frozen yogurt. <laughs> it's poop. And But what's interesting, and you see this on right here, is it has eyes. Used to be it was described to have flies, but um, they've changed that now. It's, uh, it's described to have eyes. Eyes, not flies. Chris Mark, we're getting ready for him. He talked to me to a new camera. Damn him. But I'm going to be ready for the super moon. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. That's what emojis are good for, right? Feelings. Text sometimes isn't very good at communicating feelings, especially sarcasm. When you write something sarcastic, sometimes people take it literally, you know. Oh, sure. I'm just going to run outside, stand in the middle of the street and take off my clothes. And they say, don't do that. No, no, I was being sarcastic. And then you that's why you need some emojis to indicate sarcasm and other feelings. Let's take some uh, phone calls. Speaking of feelings, Kim Schaffer is here, our phone answerer. Hello, Kim. Hello. How are you? Do you use emojis in your... Uh... I, I do. Yeah. 
Um, I do too. I like emojis. But I laugh. Uh, I got my mom an iPhone a few years back, and she's all about the emojis. Moms cracks me up. Love emojis. <laughs> I showed my mom. How to do the Apple, the new Apple Messages stuff with mm -hmm. not just emojis, but big emojis and all sorts of... And she can't stop doing it. She's like crazy, going yes. crazy with the effect. I think, in fact, they even said when Apple introduced its new Messages program, that's the mom feature, which is mean. Everybody uses emojis, <laughs> not just your mom. Yeah, but she she didn't even know how to text. And now, now. She, now she's all about the Don't emoji. you hate that? Yeah. Don't you <laughs> hate that? Now I get the most random text <laughs> from her. And I, I feel like I did myself a disservice. <laughs> yeah. So you've been answering the phones, yes? I have. And, and have you selected uh, somebody for yeah, our debut? Yeah, Lanny wants to record his webinars and wants to know oh. if we know how to do that. Lanny, record his webinars. Thank you, Kim. Hi, Lanny in Simi Valley. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Welcome. Yo, Leo. Good to talk to you again. I'm actually in Woodland Hills today, but I live in Simi Valley. Currently. Close enough. Close I enough. I have a number of questions. That's just the first one, and they're all, they all should be short. Anyway, so I'm... I'm Getting a lot of web, we're watching a lot of webinars now, and right now I'm putting my camera in front of my monitor and, and recording oh, them, and then put, yeah, and put it, putting in, put it into uh, into uh, Premiere Pro and taking out all the junk that you know all the pitter, all the pitter patter in between the useful information. So, so I have a good record. Yeah, webinars are uh, kind of like uh, Skype calls with large groups watching. So it's an yeah. online a seminar, and you and. Uh, you can. There's a variety of programs you can use. Truthfully, the best webinar programs have built-in recording. Well, okay, these come through uh, Citrix. Yeah. I don't know if I can. Go, yeah, go to webinar has built-in recording. It does. Yes. For, for, for the watcher. For the watcher. Oh, for the watcher. No, for the presenter. I get yeah, it. I, I know You're that. watching I these, and you want to record them. Yeah, I without get using it. my camera. Without using my camera. Yeah, you can get a screen recorder for sure. Are you on Windows or Mac? Windows 10. Well, window, yeah, I'm on Windows. I either a 10 or a, or, or a uh, 7 computer. I've got so that. Windows 10 has a screen recorder built in, <laughs> believe well, it or not. That's curious. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, What's it called? Um, well, it's called the Very Creative Screen Recording Utility. Now, who would have thought of that? <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not super powerful. It's really meant for, I think, recording gaming. That's the. That's the. The reason there's a lot of these things is because uh, gamers. The hottest category in gaming is called Let's Play, where you play a game. You may record your your video as well, and you and you put it on YouTube. <laughs> so, the weird okay. thing about Windows 10 uh, recording utility is the Xbox app has to be running. Oh, I don't have an Xbox. Yes, you do. It. It's built into Windows 10, and if you don't have it, you can get it on the Windows Store. Xbox app. You don't need an Xbox to use it. <laughs> and you don't really need to... You just switch out of the Xbox app until your webinar. So you run the Xbox app. That has the recording built into it. Okay. Well, and then it records whatever the current window is. So you, you fire it up, you start recording, then you switch over... To your your webinar, and you've got the whole thing as a recorded video. Now, if that's not, and it isn't the most powerful system, there are better systems. Oh, a lot of people can use, assume, huh? Can I assume it records the audio too? Yeah, you keep saying video. Okay. Yeah, audio and video. Uh, okay. The other way to do it is to get a, a program. A lot of uh, people and people in the chat room are telling me use something called the Open Broadcasting Software (OBS). OBS okay. Studio, and that's available for Windows and Mac and Linux, and it will it's give it's it's probably more to your liking because it has built-in editing and stuff. So well, well, I don't need that. I, I can. Oh, I thought you edited it. Okay, yeah, but I mean, it makes it easy. So okay. uh, that will also record a window. That's what they use on Twitch, which is the number one way to watch uh, gaming, right? So OBS yeah. is free and open. Probably don't even go, need to go beyond that. There are many others like Fraps and so forth. But this is this is what everybody uses now. OBS Studio. It's at obsproject.com. OBS Project. Okay. Um, another quick one, if yeah, I can. Sure. Actually, I've got several other quick ones. Do you have an eFax recommendation? Facts? E <laughs> e 
<laughs> well, I presume you don't have a fax modem. You want to do it over the internet, right? Well, I just I just got rid of all three of my landlines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody does. No, I mean, I shouldn't say nobody. Probably banks and realtors still do it because for some reason that I really don't understand, it's deemed uh, more uh, reliable to trust your signature on a faxed piece of paper than any other much more effective form of digital authentication, like digital signatures. There are digital signatures, you know, like uh, you probably used um, DocuSign and things like that. These are much, much, oh, yeah. much more effective than my handwritten signature on a fax. Nevertheless, <laughs> for some reason, maybe, maybe just, you know, unwillingness to change with the times, people still use faxes. So nowadays what most people uh, do is they do it digitally. So there's services that you can send a fax through, and you, in effect you email or upload your fax to those services. I use e-fax, uh, but e-fax is kind of expensive. If you don't send a lot of faxes, and who sends a lot of faxes anymore? It's not, not it's not worth the monthly fee. So there are free and inexpensive fax solutions that will basically let you send an email or upload a file. You'll have to, you know, you, if, it's, if somebody gave you a piece of paper and said, sign this and fax it to me, then what you'll have to do is take the piece of paper, sign it, scan it, <laughs> and upload it. But that's kind of what a fax machine does, too. If you think about it, when you roll it through the fax machine, it's scanning it. And then it converts it into sound, which is sent over a phone line. And uh, the sound is reconverted into a printed page on that fun, curly, thermal paper at the oh, other well, end. More, Leo. <laughs> let's just get rid of let's get. Yeah, they have plain paper faxing. And actually, if you know, if you don't mind using a phone line, there's a lot of multifunction printers that have fax capability built in. All those Epson printers we advertise, almost all of them. I have one. Yeah, they have a they have, have a phone one. jack. But I just don't I just don't want to use it. I I, I, I don't want to pay forty five dollars a month. For a phone line, for a fax that I'm going to use once every four months. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's so that's why you want to use an online service. And, you know, we'll put on the sh in the show notes, there's a bunch of them. eFax e is owned by JFax. They have some solutions. Uh, okay. There are free fax solutions out there. Um, the I'm, I'm not sure. I, tr I, I feel like eFax does have a free plan. All right. eFax has a free plan. I hope I don't. You try it. Make sure they don't put like an ad on the fax. I don't know what how they support a free plan. But eFax is the one I use. And I still pay for a number. So it, you can get incoming faxes as well. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You know what happened, Robert, with the Chromebook Pro? I don't know. Because there was that leak. Yeah. Samsung's probably. You know what? I wonder if Samsung is saying. We won't, let's not release any tech products for a while, like till people forget about the note. Yeah, remember you'd have a fax modem and you'd have the WinFax software on your machine. <laughs> Frankly, for occasional faxing, uh, I think one of these uh, all in one printers that does faxing is fine. And then we have a phone line, we have to have a phone line in the house for a, uh, a well, we had an alarm system put in and, uh, at the time, they couldn't use, now they can, but at the time, they couldn't use cell phones. So um, we had a phone line put in. And I just pay the, like, minimum, I don't, it's probably 20 bucks a month or, anyway, just because we need the, because then we have a landline. I have no reason to have a landline. And we can get rid of it now, but I don't even, it's like, okay. So <laughs> I got it. I, you know inertia. So um, I... Uh, I can just plug in the all-in-one to the phone line and send a fax if I ever have to. It's good to have a landline for emergencies. And we and I bought phones that don't need power. So they just plug into the, the, line, the phone jack. For emergencies, it's good. I, I agree. I don't know if we have a POTS line in here. I don't think we do. I think it's all ring, ring central. I don't think... I used to sign all our checks by hand. Now, now Lisa does that. And I like a fountain pen, but what I, I do is I get... Um, I love these. Because <laughs> I, would, I, I would always have... You know, I used to buy the fancy, expensive collector mountain, fountain pens like the Mont Blanc. Now I just buy these Pilot Varsities. They're disposable fountain pens. You can't add ink. But they're great. And I buy them by, a case, by the case, like 20 of them. 
And they're, they're just, they're lovely. In fact, I have a case right here. I've, I've, I went out and bought a ton of them because I thought they were probably going to be discontinued, but Pilot still makes them. Genuine steel nib. Unique liquid ink formula. Advanced ink feed system. <laughs> Available in black, blue, pink, purple, and turquoise ink. When I was a kid, like high school and junior high, I used to write with a fountain pen, and I always have weird colored ink, like turquoise ink. I was a very pretentious child. Some say I'm still very pretentious. Yeah, loquacious. I mean, I would prefer to use, and I have very fancy fountain pens, but I always lose them, so I keep them safe at home. 8888-ASK-LEO. Uh, let's see here. Rusty San Diego is next. Hi, Rusty. Good morning, Leo. Good morning. Good to talk to you again. Good to talk to you. Hey, we're seeing all these ads coming up for Black Friday for new TVs. Yes. And it's time for us to get one, but there's just too many choices. We need some help yeah. narrowing things down. So, um, of course, the Black Friday doorbuster specials are usually, you know, they have to be very low cost. So they're usually not going to be... The newest models, the best models, they're not going to be the biggest models. So the first thing you have to decide with a flat panel TV is how big. And people always underestimate the size, you know, because you don't want it to take over your room. And, you know, goodness, our, uh, you know, our old Sony was only, uh, was, was 32 inches and that seemed huge. Remember the CRTs, a 32 inch TV was massive, but now uh, that's considered tiny on a flat panel, because they're thin and flat, they they aren't as big. They tend to start at 42 inches. And really, the question is, how far away are you going to sit? And how much do you want an immersive experience? If it's just a TV in the corner, you're going to watch a cooking show in the kitchen or something, then a 42 inch is fine, and you'll save a lot of money. But if you are going to sit down and watch a movie in the living room, and you're going to darken the room and have popcorn, you want it to be, you know, to... It's not going to be as big as a movie screen unless you sit maybe, maybe it'd be like a movie screen if you sit middle to back row of a movie theater. That's kind of what you want. You're not going it's not going to fill your vision. So if you're sitting 6 to 10 feet away, you probably want a 55 to 65 inch TV and if you're sitting farther back, you're going to want 70 or bigger. So that's the first thing to decide is the size. That's the most important thing. Bigger than you think. Do you have permission to get a big TV? Yes, we're looking at 50 to 55 inches because we have a small living room. Yeah, so if you're sitting six to six feet away, 55 is perfect. And um, the, the new 4Ks? Now, okay, that's the next step. You're, and then uh, there really used to be you had this decision between plasma, LCD, OLED. Now there's really only two. There's OLED, and that's the very expensive high end. Almost everything you're going to look at is an LCD. They're going to be backlit by LEDs. So sometimes they call them LEDs, but it's all LCD. Backlit by LEDs. Um, you, 4K is an interesting choice. Generally speaking, it doesn't cost a lot more for 4K these days. Almost all the panels they're making are 4K. There's not a lot of content, but a good 4K TV with 4K content. And you can get 4K content if you get a UHD Blu-ray player. That's the new new Blu-rays, not the old ones, the new Blu-ray players, or you get, if you have Netflix and use a 4K streamer, or you have... And by the way, this is something to consider. You're not just going to get a TV. Now, if you use an AV receiver, you have to get a 4K-capable AV receiver. Not all of them are. Most of them aren't. And then you have to, if you're going to use a Roku or an Apple TV or whatever, Apple TV doesn't even have 4K, but Roku has 4K. You're going to want to upgrade that or, uh, you know, so you have to start thinking about how am I going to get my content? You're going to upgrade your Blu-ray player. So this is all something to keep in mind. It's not just the TV. And by the way, that's why they do the doorbuster. They know you're not going to stop there. You're going to go in and buy the TV, and then, and then you're going to go crazy with everything else. And you kind of need to if you want to watch 4K. That's so, why we're calling you. Yeah, 4K, I, you know, all these decisions. you don't need to. If price is an issue, you take, consider 1080p. 
to you know don't you, HD is fine but if but if you're looking at TV and you want 4K my suggestion is get the new standard which is UHD ultra high def that's what the real that's what the real name of 4K is UHD ultra high def as opposed to high def and premium is the standard UHD premium and that has some other things that you do want in terms of picture quality, including the range of colors it can display and high dynamic range, which means there's a bigger distance between the darkest darks and the whitest whites. And that makes a big difference. So if you can afford it, UHD Premium. Uh, Samsung has a stand a TV called the SUHD, which predated UHD Premium. It was from early this year. Uh, those are good, too. As far as brands, Vizio is great. Samsung is great. Sony is great. All the names you know. LG. I have an LG. Uh, all the names you know are fine. And um, we're assuming we're going to need a sound bar with that. Well, that's the next. Yeah. See, this is why it's not a. It's not. It's it can become expensive. Uh, yeah, the TV comes with speakers. They're not great. So again, this is a big change from the days of the 32 inch, you know, RCA TV. Which, you know, you had your speaker on the TV and that was that. Nowadays, you're going to want to have a more a surround sound. Now, the least expensive, simplest, least elaborate way to go is, of course, the sound bar. It simulates surround sound with multiple speakers, but they're all right under the TV, so it can't do a great job. It just does a decent job. You might want to look at a sound bar plus subwoofer because, of course, the little speakers in a sound bar can't reproduce the low bass, so a subwoofer can help. I'm adding price here. I'm just telling you your range. The next step up from a sound bar, which is the preferred way to do it if you can afford it, is to get an AV receiver that supports surround sound. And with that, you'll get a lot of other speakers, either a 5.1 system, which is six total speakers, left and right channel, center channel, subwoofer, and two surrounds off, off to your ears on the left and right, kind of to your side. There's even 7.1, and now... There's an, a new thing which uh, Scott Wilkinson Love calls Atmos, which either reflects sound off the ceiling or has speakers on the ceiling to give you, you know, a complete... The idea is to create a complete sphere of sound. And in a movie theater, that's what you're getting. Again, it depends on how much of a home theater experience you want to create. Sound bar's fine. As a start, eventually you probably want to shoot for the AV receiver in this 5.1 or 7.2 sound. Okay, and in our watching Netflix with our Roku box, with the with the new TVs, a lot of that comes built in. Right. Um, can we then take the Roku box we have in our living room and move it to yeah. one of the bedrooms? Yeah, as long as this, you know, the smart TVs and uh, you know, there's a variety of software in these TVs. Some better. I'm not crazy about Samsung. I like the LG smart TV, um, but you they have Netflix. They have. Hulu. They may not have all the channels your Roku is capable of, but if they have the ones you care about, yeah, you could take your Roku out, put it somewhere else. And that, if you get a 4K TV, the advantage of that is that will be 4K. That source will be 4K because it's built into the TV. So when we're looking at this, we'll, we'll look at our size and make and everything of the TV. Yep. We'll need a sound bar. Yep. And then uh, probably a new Blu ray. Yeah, if you want to watch discs, although that's fading out, right? Even Sony's new PlayStation Pro doesn't have a Blu-ray player in it because they say it's all going to be streaming. And Netflix streams 4K, Vudu rents 4K movies, uh, Amazon Prime has 4K, so there's a lot of 4K out there. So at, over the Internet, that may be enough. If your Internet's fast enough, you really want 15 to 20 megabits down. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's talk about ZipRecruiter. Zip Recruiter, if you're the person in your organization that has to hire, it's kind of a double-edged sword, isn't it? You're short-handed, uh, but you need to get to work on getting somebody to fill that position. And if you're like, if you're a sole proprietor or it's a small business, that could really be a hassle unless you've got Zip Recruiter. Even big businesses use Zip Recruiter, many of the Fortune 500. And I'll tell you why. First of all, one post to ZipRecruiter.com. Posts to 100-plus job boards, including Twitter and Facebook, all the social networks. Now, why would you want that? Well, let's assume the right person for that job is out there. I'm sure that's the case. But, but where do they live? What are they looking at? How do you get to them? Well, the more places you post that job, the better. And I know what you're going to say. Well, if I post to all these boards, am I not going to get way too many 
applicants? Yeah, you're going to get a lot of them. In fact, you're going to get even more because ZipRecruiter has millions of resumes on file. People uh, use ZipRecruiter as a job board. So you'll immediately, within 24 hours, start receiving applicants. But here's the beauty part. They're easy to manage, no matter how many. You want as many as possible because they all come into the ZipRecruiter interface where it's easy to rank them. There's even a thumbs up, thumbs down button. You can just go right through them, screen out the ones you don't want. If you need more information, you can set up uh, questionnaires or tests, multiple choice, free form, yes, no formats. So you can get more information from all the candidates. It's completely automated. So you screen them, get the ones out you don't want, rank the rest, hire the right person fast in days. One million businesses have used ZipRecruiter, including many of the biggest companies like Ford and Netflix and Burger King and AT&T and Verizon and Target and Dell and PayPal and Stanford University. This is because it works. We've used ZipRecruiter. We love it. More than 160 million, actually it's more than that. What is it? 170 million candidate applications delivered. Here's the deal. Try it free. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Twit, you'll have the right person fast. And, you know, hiring the right person is awesome. It makes such a difference at your company. ZipRecruiter's the way. ZipRecruiter.com slash T-W-I-T. And we thank you for their support. It makes the Tech Guy podcast possible. Great Leon Russell. Passed away this week at the age of 74. It's been a bad week. My, uh... One of my favorite singer-songwriters, Leonard Cohen, also passed away at 82 this week. Um, it's a bad year, hasn't it? Between Bowie and... I mean, it's just been a bad year. 88, 88, but that's what happens when you get old, they tell me. Your friends start to pass on. 88, 88, ask Leo. 88, 88, ask Leo. That's the phone number. Prince, yeah. He was too young. Too young. Uh, Troy on the line from uh, Morton, Washington. Hello, Troy. Leo, thank you for taking my call. Thanks for calling. Well, um, before I get to the question, uh, I, I hate to do this to you on national, national radio, but I've decided I'm going to need your technical support for about the next, well, I'm going to be around for about another 30 or 40 years. <laughs> so whatever changes you need to do to your retirement plan. <laughs> I love, I'll do this until I can't do it. I, I, it's too much fun, and it's really, I mean, let's face it, it's not like working for a living. Well, it's so, a great service. I know. I, I, appreciate I feel very fortunate. You know, when I, you start out in radio, your dream is to have a nationally syndicated radio show. That's as high as you can go. I, I pinch myself every uh, every morning when I come in here. I, it's a good, <laughs> I'm very lucky. So uh, 30 years, I don't know. I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. I turn 60 this year, you know. This is going to be, that's going to be a challenge. All right. Well, maybe you can help me with this one today. All right. About three years ago, I bought an iMac. Yep. And then uh, right after I got it, I installed Windows on it using the Apple Boot Camp software. The approved and Apple method, yes. That's right. And I had no problems with that at all. Windows 10 came out, and I upgraded to Windows 10 with no problem. Good. And I liked Windows 10 so much that in perhaps a, a bad move, I eliminated all the other partitions except <laughs> Windows 10. You turned your Mac into a Windows PC. <laughs> and now the problem I have is I'd like to do a clean install. Yeah, you can't. So, so what you did was ill-advised. It's fine to shrink the Mac partition down to next to nothing. You know, just keep four or six gigabytes and leave the Mac on there. And the reason is you have to get the drivers through Apple. And to do what you want to do, you need a Macintosh operating system to do a clean install. You see? Right. As long as you just, you know, you, you, you're just running in Windows, you can get the updates. There's, a, there's an Apple software updater and you get the updates. But the minute you want to start with a clean install, you're going to need to make the Windows install disk. You can do that. That's no problem. But remember what happened in Boot Camp? You then launched... You know, you launched the bootcamp app and it downloaded the Apple drivers and put them on that USB key before you did the install. Right. That's the only key, the Apple drivers. Um, well, I've got those saved from before when I, yeah. when I did this. The, the problem I'm having is when I restart my computer with that Windows uh, flash drive all set up, 
it, I can't get it to boot from the flash drive. It just always loads Windows. And even when I click on the Boot Camp Assistant in Windows and say restart in, in, in Apple, or you know, it, it doesn't do it. It just always loads Windows. Yeah. Um, so even if you hold the Option key when you boot up? Yeah, even then. It never sees the USB drive. No, I can't. I can't seem to make it do that. And I tried just forgetting about the uh, uh, flash drive and just rebooting using the boot camp uh, icon there to restart in OS X. But, of course, there's no other partition, so it doesn't do anything. It just restarts into Windows. So I'm looking at um, a blog post uh, from Fotsi. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, installing Windows 10 on a Mac without boot camp, and it addresses these kind of weird issues. <clears throat> Um, he says, installing Windows on a Mac should be a piece of cake with Boot Camp, but that rarely is the case. Oh, this is without Boot Camp, though. But that's kind of what you're saying, because you don't want to use Boot Camp, right? right? Um, so he has a description of how to get the drivers, as you've already done. You've got those drivers. You need the Boot Camp Assistant to get those drivers, but you've got those, so keep them around. You've created a Windows 10 installer. Um, and then he has some terminal commands here. How do you, why can't you boot up? That is very odd. Ah, oh, this might have to do with the, the GPT versus master boot record problem. You're using, Apple uses uh, not BIOS, but EFI for boot up. UEFI, and I'm betting that's what's going on here. So they recommend, he's recommending an additional program that will create a G, make your disk a GPT disk. Wow, is this complicated. Tell you what, I'll put, <laughs> I'll put this in here. I don't, I don't know if this uh, addresses specifically your issues, but this allows you to install Windows on a Macintosh if, without the Mac partition. So okay. it doesn't see the flash drive. Did you, where did, how did you make the flash drive? Uh, just we're going to the uh, window, Microsoft Windows. Use their media creation tool. Exactly, yeah. Uh, chat room, any suggestions? Uh, is it an issue with... It seems like it's a, it's a compatibility. It's, this is, you know, because Apple doesn't expect you and does, certainly doesn't want you to use a Macintosh without running OS X at some point. <laughs> right. It seems to me this is related. And I'd always, this actually article surprises me because I'd always been told, oh, no, no, no. You've got to, uh, you've got to have a little bit of a Mac partition. I would recommend that just in case. Okay. Um, pressing the option key is supposed to choose between bootable media. So if you have a truly, and you've checked to see if you can, did you boot from that USB key ever before you zapped all the partitions? Oh, at various times, I think I've used okay. it before. So you know it's bootable. Or, yes. Okay. And the biggest problem I had was even pressing like the option key on all the funky combinations uh, to try to get into the the Mac version or, or the iOS version of uh, uh, ah. the this is, I think this issue is EFI. Yeah. I can't um, get into that at all. Yeah. I was thinking, well, maybe I could just restore my Mac partition by downloading it from Apple. But so what the magical thing that Boot Camp is doing, I didn't realize this, is it's, uh, it's emulating BIOS for the <laughs> Windows operating system. Oh. Uh, without Boot Camp, Windows won't detect a BIOS, and it, it, it won't boot. That's bizarre um i'm looking at a core i'll put a link to a couple of things for you in our show notes that might help you thank you uh, i'm looking at a quora q a how do i install windows 7 on a mac pro without os 10 or and and it's got a fairly basically fairly long answer that says you can't <laughs> okay and i in it now i didn't realize this but uh, i did not realize that um windows wouldn't uh, boot in in a in a pure EFI environment, so that surprises me. It seems like that's something it should do. Um, you need to use a, a boot manager, not the Mac boot manager. Uh, something like uh, Refind R E F I N D boot manager. 
and that uh, will apparently help you boot this uh, this disk, this okay. USB drive. Uh, again, I'll may put this at techguylabs.com tech because it's kind of... May, may I, I ask you a much quicker question about yeah. Google? Yeah. Uh, so I use the Google Play Music uh, service, and one of the things you can do is uh, specify where your music files are and then have it upload. Right. And it doesn't count against your Google Drive space, so that's one thing I've done. Um, but it never seems to finish uploading. I know, me too. <laughs> so I think there are a few files it can't upload. For instance, you may have some old iTunes files that have copy protection. There are files it won't be able to upload. I notice there's quite a few files I can't upload. Okay. So it, I, ha I just keep it running in the background at all times because it watches those particular folders, including the iTunes folder, but any additional folders you add. And it will upload songs if you put new songs in there. Okay. I was trying to figure out a way to see which files it couldn't upload, and I couldn't see a way to do that. Which particular individual files? R right. Yeah, so I think it goes by folder. Oh, okay. Yeah, just so you have to just put, yeah, specify, but you can specify additional folders, so just make sure you specify all the folders that you use. Okay. And then I, I have noticed, I mean, I'll get this warning from time to time, couldn't upload those three files, and my guess is... There's something about those files that's particularly iTunesy, like copy protection. That's my Ideal. guess. Well, thank you. I hey, promise, not more than thirty years. <laughs> All right, and I will put links to two articles that might help you get through this. I'm trying to read them as we're talking, so I'm maybe not completely communicating the right information here. So read these articles; they might give you the information you need. Thank you. All right, and in general, my understanding is you really do want to. Keep even the smallest, little, tiniest, minimum Mac partition just, just so you can keep using Windows. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So here's the Quora article, James. And here's the Fotsies article. Up on a tight rope. No, you know what? I have to ask John. Um, but the Apple Store, so there was a screw up, and the Apple Store canceled our order and then recreated it, moving it to a later date. Supposedly, people ordered it day of, which we did originally until the Apple Store screwed up. Uh, uh, so, uh, usually, what I do, and it always makes John mad is I do this myself, you know. And he says, no, no, you got to go through our business guy at the Apple store because we get a, whatever, 5%, really ridiculous, 5% discount. And this one time, because I was out of town, I said, okay, John, you get it. You call the business guy and get it. So if I had ordered it as I always do, I would have paid 5% more, but I would have it on. I think they're coming for most people this week, probably Tuesday, right? And we had heard that they would be in the Apple store around the 15th. So my hope is, so our plan, anyway, this is our plan. We ordered a 13 and a 15. Uh, what happened was um, when I saw the price for it, I said to John, order a 13 and 15 maxed out. What I didn't understand, what I didn't realize is that the maxed out 15 is $4,000. <laughs> and mostly that's because of the hard drive because it's a two terabyte SSD. So I said, John, I don't need a two terabyte SSD. See if you can uh, change the order to a 512 and save me 1500 bucks on that order. And um, so he just called the business guy and said, and asked him that question. The guy said, no, you know, if to do that, I'll have to cancel your order and redo it, which will push your ship date back. And John said, no, don't do that. But somehow there was a miscommunication, and he did exactly that. He canceled our order, recreated it with a ship date in December. So we currently have a, a ship date in December for the 15 and the 13. But our new plan, and I'm crossing my fingers, is the minute they arrive in the stores, which I, th I think is Tuesday, we will run. I'll be at the store the, the minute it opens, and I'll get whatever they have. <laughs> so I'm hoping, you know, we'll, that if I can get in there uh, and we'll get, we'll get at least one. I may not get two. I may just get the 13 because I'm thinking, I'm thinking the keyboard is not what I want. Um, yeah, it was expensive, 7080, that's right. So um, I'll, I'll run to the store the minute they have it in the store, and we'll get something. So I'm hoping we will have a computer. 
this week to review for you. Yeah, and the and the, um, the Surface uh, Studio is December fifteenth. I said Surface, and I got all excited. November twenty eighth. Yeah, I th I'm just crossing. And what we'll do is, if we get it at the store, we'll cancel the December. Yeah, it was. Well, no, I ordered the Apple. I ordered the Mac at the same time as I um, as the the moment they announced it, we ordered it. Yeah, it's something like that, Mike. I choked when I saw it. I went. But Crucial Wax, that three dollar keyboard is better than the keyboard on the MacBook. Because it has full key travel. So that's why I'm kind of reluctant to get the 15. I really wanted a new MacBook. Because mine is three years, four years old. It's 2012. But... Um, Instead, I bought myself a camera. A camera. <laughs> well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, and all that jazz. 88, 88, ask Leo the number. Back to the phones. Chris in Miami. Hello, Chris. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. What's going on? Running his cheeks all the way to the desk. All right. <laughs> so you didn't, didn't think I'd take you so quickly, did you? Oh, he's not even listening. Let's try... Uh, here, I'll put him on hold. And Tony in Louisville. Hi, Tony. How you doing? Leo, good afternoon. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Um, listen, I haven't heard you... Um, uh, talk about your Eros. Um, needless to say, I bought a set myself, got rid of my Apple. Um, 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 I had uh, two routers running around the house. Well, not running, but, you know, uh, doing the uh, wireless in my house. But uh, uh, put those away and got a set of three, uh, the uh, Eros. Yeah. And uh, I'm having issues with it. Have you been experiencing that? So uh, let me tell you, no, but let me tell you what, what the Eero is first. So people are listening going, what is he talking about? E-E-R-O. And it is one of a number of new categories of Wi-Fi uh, access points. The Eero was the first out, but we're seeing or waiting for uh, new ones from Amazon bought a company or invested heavily in a company called the Luma. We should get a Luma's. Uh, they were delayed. I don't know if they've gone out or not. Then there's the Plume, which is supposed to come out next month. And even Linksys has uh, decided well, this must be a hot category. So what makes these unique? Well, you know, I, I haven't gone deep into the technology, and I probably should. The Eero, when you buy it, as you said, you typically buy uh, three units, which is expensive. That's about five or 600 bucks for the three units. And... Uh, the idea is they create a Wi-Fi mesh network in your home. In other words, they overlap. Uh, it's not, ex as I, I gather, it's not exactly the same as a repeater. They, uh, they are kind of equals. They're all the same kind of unit. And they, they create overlapping spheres that are supposed to extend the Wi-Fi throughout your house. The Euros do a lot of other things designed to make it easier for people to uh, set up and use Wi-Fi. For instance, they have a, a, an app for the iPhone or Android devices that uh, logs you into the Eero. The, once you log in and create an Eero account, it will automatically keep updated for you. So unlike almost every Wi-Fi router to date, uh, it, it updates its firmware, and it does it fairly frequently. I notice the firmware get up, firmware updates come fairly like every few weeks, so that's a good thing. Nowadays, we know that Wi-Fi security is a you know, big issue on Wi-Fi routers. It also has, uh, you know, it doesn't have the more elaborate features of the real geeky routers. I run two completely independent Wi-Fi systems in my house, one through the Eero and one for the Asus uh, 3200 router, which uh, is a geek router. So it has 18 pages of settings 
And you can do all sorts of stuff. You can't do all that with the Eero, but it has enough. Uh, I have not had any problems with it. Um, it it's been working flawlessly. Uh, no, I used to get screams from the other room. I can't get on the Wi-Fi. What problems are you having? Well, um, the uh, house, the, the design of the house, it's in the sh in the uh, shape, and there's an upstairs and a downstairs. Okay. Well, the problem is that the the back room where I'm at right now, we I have one Eero, and they are all connected, hardwired connected to to uh, to to the router. That's one thing that that's one thing that's unique with the Eero. You can, you know, typically you'll have a base unit that is connected to the route to the cable modem or whatever, and the rest will be. Just wireless, but you can't have all three Eros ether connected via Ethernet. So you have all three of them connected. Are they? To, but they're separate, right? They're spread out through the house, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And and uh, but the but the problem is that for whatever reason, um, for instance, the last update that we had a couple of days back, it uh, it corrected an issue that we were having with the uh, Apple phones. My I've got a fourteen and a sixteen year old, and and uh, and. They were not. They, they weren't able to uh, connect to the Wi-Fi. So I, you know, I called them up, and after the update came through, then they were able to connect. Yet, although my 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 phone, I have an Android, I was able to connect. Right. You know, to the this is one thing, by the way. By paying that much money to Eero, you do at least get very good phone support. I, I called them a couple this of times. Is true. Yeah. This so is true. Uh, that's interesting because I I use iPhones and Android phones on our Eero systems, no problem at all. The Eero signal is the strongest signal in the house, no matter where I am, even outside. So yeah. it, I often choose the Eero signal on all of my devices. Um, yeah, another issue that I'm having is the same issue that I was having with the uh, with the Apple routers was that um, um, the uh, signal gets you know slows down. Now I do not know if it is if it is uh, from the from the from the company. If it was happening before, and it's happening now, I am guessing it's your internet service provider. Uh, one thing you can do with the Euro software, I'm sure you know this, is see it does regular bandwidth checks. So you can see, I'm 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 here in the studio. I can actually see what the bandwidth is like at my house right now. Have you tried that? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and it's always showing the same. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the uh, arrows they're always showing uh, um, um, certain speed, uh, download speed, and upload speed. And yet, when uh, when when I have uh, one of my sons run the uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, speed through, you know that the SEC has a has an app. And I trust it a lot sure. more than we need. trust the uh, the uh, uh, speedtest dot net or whatever. Sure, absolutely, yeah. Push through, um, so it, and that shows a different speed. So it's it's kind of it's kind of strange. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm kind of debating whether or not returning, you know, and and trying something else. Well, if it's not working for you, and and, and they haven't been able to satisfy you with with the support. Um, there, you know, it might be that you'd do better off. I love this Asus AC3200 router. They have replaced it with an even more modern router. I think it's uh, it's it's great. You, it, it requires a bit of a geekitude, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Because, as I said, 18 pages of settings and there's everything in there. But if you know what you're doing, I think because it's so configurable, you can uh, do more with the Asus router than you can do with the Eero. I don't know why you're having trouble. Um, I'm I'm looking right now at my Eero. Even though I'm at work, I can see the speed test. The last time it did a speed test was uh, at 12:43 uh, a.m. this morning, and uh, it is not as fast as I would get if I were hardwired. So I'm not sure what Eero does in that regard. It's it's a little slower than my nominal, but I can see all the devices. I have 29 devices on that Eero, so that's a lot, right? Um, yeah. I can see, you know, the, that all three Eros are working properly. You can also add Eros. You know, you buy a, buy a fourth and fifth one if there are... You, you know what you might want to do? It sounds like you do have an Android phone, right? Yes, I do. Yeah, you can't do Wi-Fi analyzers uh, on iOS because Apple doesn't give third parties access to the uh, Wi-Fi signal. But there are good Wi-Fi analyzers uh, for Android. And maybe get an, a Wi-Fi analyzer... And take a look at uh, the channels, the signals, wander around the house, see what's happening as you wander around, if there's places where it's falling off. These things can be very useful. 
Uh, and it may be that that's, and I hate to, you know, you should, we shouldn't have to do this, right? It should be easy. And that was the, prem the premise of Eero. Google now has a similar device. Was these are, these are supposed to be for normal people. But Wi-Fi is tough. So I maybe get an analyzer. See if there's problems in your home. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I don't think I did the disclaimer that they're a sponsor. Shoot. I'll do that when I come back. So, and maybe you should, maybe you should send it back. If it's not working for you, uh, Chris, I'm not Chris. Um, oh, he's gone. Oh, well. Uh, maybe you should send it back, right? Oh, I love the Pixel. No, no, no. I love the Pixel. This is uh, definitely my Android choice. Although, you know, that will change. I've been dethroned as mayor of Glamour Nails. Hmm. I don't know if the on, you know, the first on hub was not very impressive. Is Google shipping the on hubs now? I can't, I can only do two. Networks at a time because I only have two internet connections in the house. <laughs> only. That's actually a nice thing because I have by having two, I have uh, the capability of um, of uh, trying different systems in the same environment. The Euro definitely does better than the AC thirty two hundred, but the AC thirty two hundred is one router, and the Euro is three. So, yeah, Google has this new on hub thing. Are they shipping it though? I don't. I haven't seen any uh, reviews of it yet. Google Wi-Fi. It's a lot cheaper. Yeah, waitlist. Same idea though, right? And I don't know if they're all the same technology or not. Somebody in the chat room was saying, and I, I presume this is true, that one of the reasons these are better than doing repeaters is there are two radios in each Eero, one to connect to the base station and one to give you connectivity, which means you don't have the degradation of the speed as you add hubs. I don't know if that's true or not. Network assist works behind the scenes. That's kind of what the Eero does, too, to avoid congestion. Does handoffs, yeah. Just, yeah, I think this is about the same. Ubiquity kind of pioneered this, right? Uh, I had the XL. Mostly it was because I couldn't get 128 gigabyte XL. So the XL I had was a 32 gig. We got it Verizon. Uh, and I had ordered this. This is another case of, you know, you snooze, you lose. I was in Florida <laughs> or somewhere. Well, where was I? I guess I was in Florida, yeah, when, they, when Google had its event. So I, I was on a plane actually flying back, and when I um, – no, not Florida. That was October 4th. I was, that was coming back from vacation. So when I landed, I ordered it immediately, but it wasn't going to come until, this, until you know, like a week ago or two weeks ago. So we heard, it, heard that Verizon had phones in store. So I sent Karsten, who was a Verizon subscriber. He got one. But it was the XL, but it was only 32 gigs. That's all they had. And I wanted more storage. So I kept my order. Didn't cancel my uh, order for the little one. And I kind of like the little one. You know, it's 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 very pocketable. I have the iPhone 7 Plus. So I don't need... Um, I don't think that... I don't think that that's true. I would say the battery life is identical. Because remember, um, this is a smaller uh, screen with a lower res screen. Battery life is very good on this. I don't know about fast charging. I don't, is that true that one is not as fast? I don't know about that. I find this very nice phone. I like it. Our show today brought to you by Atlassian. Makes such great stuff. The Jira. They make the Confluence. <laughs> they make the hip chat. We use it all. We're all into uh, Atlassian. Tools to help teams work better together. And now, if you're an IT department, you're going to love the new Jira Service Desk. Based on the Jira platform, 
It delivers everything your IT team needs to keep track of, you know, support tickets, to help support people, uh, to get the job done efficiently at a, as, as little as $10 a month. Now, I've talked to a lot of support professionals. You know, you, most of you use software of some kind, some sort of ticketing system, but almost everybody universally hates the system they're using. You've got to check out Jira Service Desk. This is brand new. Gives customers an easy way to ask you for help. Helps you stay on top of uh, things like if you have a service level agreement with us, with customers, uh, you can manage that. You know, some customers get better support than others, but you got these dynamic support queues that'll handle that. You got mobile alerts if it's like really important. Your agents will be more productive if you have a call center putting out fires, helping employees get stuff done. Automate repetitive tasks so your support team can focus on solving the important stuff and not the stuff that's just day in, day out. Jira Service Desk, they're great for external support teams too. And those who want to use customer feedback to guide product development, you can filter queues, customize SLAs, pull reports by organization. And it works with all the other Atlassian products. For instance, Confluence. You can use Confluence to build a support knowledge base and then Jira Service Desk to access it. Your team can give you quick and easy support answers to your customer's request. We've started using it here. We love it. Well, we, we are all in on Atlassian. We use Jira for app development, uh, for projects, to manage projects. We use HipChat. Every team has its own HipChat channel. Uh, and I'm on all of them. So, we can, you know, it's easy to communicate, find out what's going on, to ask questions uh, from production to sales. And, in fact, we're now uh, using Jira Service Desk to track the, uh, the projects our IT departments go use in our engineering team so we know how every project who's who's doing it how it's moving what state what stage it's in we use the customization uh, to create our own kanban board with swim lanes and all that service desk also gives you and this was something jira did so well real-time visualizations so you can see the burn down rate and everything but also once a task is completed you move the ticket over like phys it looks like physically I mean, you're dragging it over to the completed column that's satisfying that is a nice feeling as you progress that task along. And of course, it works with HipChat. So you can get notifications from Jira Service Desk into HipChat and vice versa. Easy to set up, very affordable, as I mentioned. I want you to try it. In fact, if you're one of the first 100 people right now to go to Atlassian.com slash twit and sign up for a free trial, this fabulous t-shirt could be yours. What does it say? It's like the Konami code. Up, 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 down, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, start. It's like the Konami code for your IT team. <laughs> First 100 signups, get the T-shirt. See why over 200 IT teams love Jira Service Desk by trying it with a free seven-day trial today. Atlassian. We love Atlassian. We do. We're all in on Atlassian. Atlassian.com slash twit. And you know what? I think they're all in on twit, which is nice. We really thank them for their support. Puppet Labs. Since deploying Jira Service Desk, we've had our resolve tickets increase by almost 67%. Given that this is an IT guy, Nick Cunningham, I'm thinking it's 66.6666666%, which is a sign that our help at desk team is able to actually get more work done. Who uses it? Everybody. You. We. We should all use it. Twitter uses it. Square uses it. Cisco uses it. Vistaprint uses it. Spotify. Atlassian.com slash twit. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888. Ask Leo. Somebody mentioned that Google has a similar uh, device to the Eero. They call it just the Google Wi-Fi. It looks exactly the same. And I guess that these are all, all of these kind of multi-unit base stations have the same, kind of roughly the same technology. I suppose we should review them all. Eero, I should mention, I, I neglected to, and I apologize uh, when our caller was asking about it, I should have mentioned it right up front, is a sponsor of uh, some of our podcasts. Um, however, I, you know, I'm of the opinion, if it's not working for him, to send it back. Absolutely. It's very expensive. It's at it's, it's 600 bucks for three units. Uh, it ought to work perfectly. You ought to be going, wow, this is great. And if you're not, there are other solutions out there. Have not been able to try the Google uh, Wi-Fi. I don't think anybody has. When I go to the website, it says, join the wait list. <laughs> and then Linksys has its uh, Orbi, same idea. Uh, these are all kind of based, I believe, on a system that uh, has been out for some time from Ubiquity. 
uh, and they it looked very similar anyway. The problem with the Ubiquiti system was very complex. It was really designed for businesses. I think we use them here. I can't remember. Um, that needed to spread Wi-Fi through a large area. But it required a base unit running on a computer with a Java program to control it. And so it really was for an IT department. But interestingly, a lot less expensive. The Ubiquiti base, the Ubiquiti satellites were only, I think, 100 bucks instead of the 200 bucks that Eero's charging. Google's a little less expensive. Those are uh, three base stations for 300 bucks, 299. So if it's all the same technology, um, and I, the problem is I don't know, but if it's all the same technology, then uh, maybe go with the Google one. Try the Google, see if it works better for you. I think a lot of what it's going to be come down to is how well these companies support you, both with firmware updates and with uh, telephone support. I've been very impressed so far with Eero. Um, and I'll get the Google as soon as I can. We'll, we'll give it a try. 8888-ASK-LEO. Now we'll go to Chris in Miami, see if, see if he's next to the phone. Hi, Chris. Leo. There he is. Hey, I am, I am so sorry about I don't know what happened there. Kim came on and she's like, you know, you got to take the call. When they, I was like, I was right here. I didn't hear him. No, no, no name. problem. What can I do for you? Okay. Um, the GPG tools. Uh, I now have Mac OS, you know, XCR on here now on my computer. And it, it says in here that please refrain from updating to the latest operating system from Apple if you're going to use this. It was you and Steve Gibson that introduced me to this. You yeah. and I used the email back. Now I don't know what to do. I mean, is there some work around that? The chat room, I've been working with them, but not too much. Is there any ideas as to what we can do to get this working? Yeah, they're up to date now. They support Sierra. Not according to their web page. Oh, wait a minute. You're right. Not I've been using it with Sierra. I guess I blew it. <laughs> <laughs> so this what is what we're. Doing? I, what it is. <laughs> I guess I blew it. So uh, this GPG is uh, stands for GNU Privacy Guard. It's the open source implementation of PGP, which stood for Pretty Good Privacy, and it is a commercial email encryption solution created by Phil Zimmerman, well, almost twenty years ago now. It is the default for email encryption. When Edward Snowden wanted to talk to uh, uh, Glenn Greenwald uh, and sent him these documents from the NSA, the first thing he said is, I'm not going to have a, say anything to you until you install and run GPG. And Glenn Greenwald, who was a journalist and not a geek, couldn't figure it out. <laughs> so uh, this is part of the problem is that uh, we, I think it's a great thing to have email encryption. It's the only way to make sure your email is secure uh, there is no other way, by the way. You may look and see, and there are companies like Proton Mail that say, oh, we'll secure your email for you. But uh, unless you're doing the encryption on your side uh, and no one else has the key to the encryption you're using, it's not secure. You know, Proton Mail says, well, we're in Switzerland. So the U.S., we're going to ignore any law enforcement requests. Well, no. You need, you, but the good news is you can use any email client. You can use anybody. You can use the woefully insecure Yahoo Mail for your email if you use encryption on your end. And the way I recommend it is the new GP, newer GPG. It's a free open source version of PGP, compat, fully compatible, uses the same exact encryption system. You can get it on Windows GPG4, the number four, Windows. You can get it on Mac GPG tools.org and of course if you're using linux it probably comes with gpg but if it doesn't it's a simple install once you have it you'll if you haven't already generated a, your key pair you'll generate a key pair the key pair is consists of two keys keys just like locks and keys kind of key it's a it's a long uh, prime number in fact i recommend you make it as long you know probably start with 2096 bits it's a long number of uh, 2000 what is it no 2048 bits and if you if you feel ambitious and you want to protect yourself and your email for years to come 4096 bits that's uncrackable widely agreed to be uncrackable the reason you have a key pair is kind of interesting it's kind of kind of genius this is the real genius of what we call public key crypto the problem with all cryptography is the key you know, in uh, traditional cryptography, 
which we call symmetric key cryptography, you encrypt with the same key that you decrypt with, right? You have to get your Captain Midnight decoder ring to understand it. When Julius Caesar used it, he would send two messengers, one with the message, one with the key, hoping that whoever is trying to decrypt the message wouldn't capture both. Because if you capture both, you can decrypt the message. So there's a kind of an inherent weakness in symmetric key crypto that somehow you have to not only transmit the, the message, but also the key to decrypt the message. It's how we broke the Enigma code during World War II. Uh, public key crypto, which was invented since then, is brilliant. You can publicly pl publish your public key. You give it to everybody. Because the public key is a one-way key. It only scrambles. It doesn't descramble. You keep very close to your chest, your private key. That's the key you use to descramble. So I can give you my public key, and I could publish it on a website. In fact, I do. Uh, and if you wanted to send me private email, that's all you'd need. You'd use that. You'd encrypt a message to me, and I'd receive it. And I and only I could read it. And no one along the way, including the email system or any server along the way, could read it. So this is a great system. And, you know, it'd be a good time to download it and install it right now. You're right, though, Chris, when you say, I'm just looking at it. And as of October 14th, which is a month ago, uh, at GPG Tools, they say our plug-in using GPG and Mail app is not yet compatible with Mac OS Sierra. So it says if you need to use GPG, don't upgrade to Sierra. Now, in the past, they've been very quick to keep up with OS X. But it's an open source project, and a new version of the operating system comes out. It's not unusual for it to be incompatible for a little while. I would bet they'll do an update soon. You can see on their website there is a workaround using the services menu. Um so that's probably what I would rely on if you've already upgraded to Sierra. And if you haven't, wait. And I would bet you within a week or two, at, at the longest, there'll be a Sierra version. Highly recommend it. I use it all the time. And my key is at leolaporte.com if you want to get it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Chris Marquardt. Hello. How are you? I blame you. What? What did you get? <laughs> <laughs> is that the four? I blame you. Is that this camera? Yeah, I blame <laughs> you. It's your fault. I didn't even tell you to get it. No, you just hint? mentioned it. No, I... D okay. I'm not on the air. Huh. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Actually, just it's it all my fault. I love it. I, sh I, I love got it a too. great picture. I want to show you my... So proud of myself. Unless, unless you do 4K video, it's a great camera. Yeah, and, and I even, might, I might try the 4K video. We'll yeah, see. even the, I mean, the 4K video quality is amazing, but the, the, the files are huge. I mean, yeah. we're talking, we're talking 500 megabits. Yeah, but that's you know because it's motion JPEG, which is a weird code yeah, to I know. use, but it's an old-fashioned code. Doesn't compress well, but it, the quality is good. I've got the, you need as huge long as the quality, parts. Well, you know what I did, and by the way, so you're right. Adding the GPS, huge. The uh, Wi-Fi, huge. Yep. Um, and um, as always with this camera, it's got so many damn buttons, and they've even added a button, <laughs> that I have and remapped it's... it everything. So now I have two back focus button buttons, depending on if I want a uh, single point one-time focus or servo oh. focus. So I, thought, I, I thought depending if you feel to, to move your thumb a bit further to the yeah, left. Yeah, that's, right. that's exactly. So I do. So I have, <laughs> I have assigned the auto focus back button. This regular one is single point focus. This one's servo. Yeah. I also reassigned the uh, depth of field preview button to shoot p movies because I didn't want to. It's too complicated. You have oh, to really? Flip the switch. Yeah. I need. I need. Yeah, I need so depth that of just view. takes uh, some I need video. The depth of Boom. field preview all the time. Oh, there's a lot of stuff I don't use. So, <clears throat> you know, I've reassigned everything. I love it. And, and isn't, isn't it nice how fast the menu system is? Oh, it's really good. And That's I like, have all these lenses. So, so I went well, out to get used to the camera, and I still I have a little work to do in terms of. Uh, you know, settings and stuff. But I went out <laughs> go, to the go back to the gym. To yeah, we had. Out. Yeah, it's heavy. Uh, we had a, um, uh, a Veterans Day parade on Friday, so I went out with the seventy two hundred, and I got Ooh. a great location with my monopod, and I took a I took four hundred eighty two pictures. Mostly, it's the triad. You know, the reason I bought this is for next June. For, next time, for next time, next time there's a parade. Get right in the middle of it with a wide-angle lens. That's another your way. Your photos, to do it. <laughs> your photos will be so much stronger. And if someone, if, if some, if some guard tries to throw you out, you just go press, and that usually works. Good. I'll try that next time. I have the sixteen thirty-five yeah, on here right now, and I and I love that. But but I 
Out of 482 shots, I got one I like. And but for me, that's a great ratio. And this is the well, shot. That, this yeah, is the no, shot no, no, I yeah. took. And oh, I was that's a very good one. Oh, I'm so happy with that shot. That's a but go next time, seriously, get closer, get more wide I angle. Will. Those shots will have so much more impact. People with big noses and stuff. No, but I not, did not that close. <laughs> not that close. <laughs> I did like the telephoto for the long shots of the prey because of the flattening. It really is it a does, nice yeah, effect. It does yeah, it does do that. But, but, but it, also, it also gives everything. The, it's such a nice camera. But it gives the viewer the feeling that you're you're kind of watching from the outside, more a paparazzo kind of yeah. feeling with the long lenses and with the wider lenses. No, you get right. this right in the middle. Um, um, who said it? Joe. Um, um, it's a good Robert idea. Kappa I'll try it. it. Yeah. Robert Kappa said it. If, you, if you're if you're if you aren't close enough, if your shots aren't good enough, you're not close enough. Well, that's true. This though, see, I'm shy. I don't want to bother people. So this, um, and the other thing is, I was still getting the, the stink eye from the police. So, yeah, tell them press. I, I, be, I dressed like, up like a press. I wore a vest. <clears throat> I had the put one monopod. Of those hats I had. On with a I did. I had a hat. On the top, yeah, you know. it was. I dressed up like the press. It, so it, <laughs> anyway, it was fun. And I and it's a great camera. It's very heavy, but you know, I got the. I got the peak design seatbelt strap. Well, that. see it as a workout for your right arm. I don't mind. Hey, do you want to do super moon? What are you going to do today? No, 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 no. Those moon things are boring. No, we'll talk about your Galapagos wide angle. We, oh, we hinted good. on that last I need time. Some help. And, and you wanted some hints on how to how much wide angle you need, and I'll tell you that you don't really need wide angle. Okay, good. We talk about photography each week at this time with Chris Marquardt, our favorite photographer. Hello. Hey, Chris, good to see you. You talked me into a new camera. No, I, yeah, All you no. had to do was mention I, I it. You mention. I don't take. I just mentioned. <laughs> you it. mention a camera, I buy it. But it might, uh, might be it might be an issue with impulse control, maybe. No, just I slightly. Keep, you know what really is? I keep thinking I'll be a better photographer if I have a new camera. Well, it's fun to to play with a new toy, and it gives you some some momentum. It gives your photography a bit of momentum, <laughs> at least for a while. It'll do that. It did. Uh, I got the Canon 5D. I was a 5D guy. I had the 5D original, the 5D Mark II. Skipped the three. Didn't seem like much of an improvement. That's exactly but, what I did. But yeah. you know what happens with these? You buy the body, and now you're buying into the system. So I have, you know, a half dozen very nice lenses. Thousands of dollars worth of lenses. So now I'm locked in, right? And you mentioned <laughs> you that the, kind of you mentioned the Mark IV had come out. I looked at, and you mentioned a few of the new features. I'm going on a very special trip next summer, so I decided. You know, I I, I bought it for my birthday. <laughs> are you are you are you hinting on the on the Galapagos trip? Yeah, I'm going to the Galapagos yeah. Islands in June with we, the family. We talked about this briefly last week, and and uh, we talked about the wide angle thing, and you were hinting at at uh, well, you were kind of asking what lens should you bring for that Galapagos thing? Especially when you look at the landscapes and the wide angle. And Yeah, usually I um, think of wide angle for landscapes, you know. Yes, and, that, and, that, and that's, a, that's an initial impulse because you know what makes these these landscapes so amazing is that you see, just, just, just try to figure out how much, how big the angle is that you see with your eyes. Just take your two hands and move them to the sides and move them back and wiggle your fingers. And then at the moment when you don't see any wiggling anymore, you look left and right and you figure out that it's about 180 degrees that you see okay. with your eyes. Yeah. And have you ever heard that that uh, someone said, you know, you should use a 50 millimeter because it looks at the world yeah. like you do with your eyes? Yeah, I have. And now, now here's here's the big problem. The angle of view of our eyes are 100, 180 degrees. The 50 millimeter lens only has about 40 degrees. So they, they are not the same. They are very different from the angle of view. The only way they are kind of similar is that you get the same sort of proportions of things you know if you look at uh, if you look through a wide angle lens you get this exaggerated depth everything that's far away is so much further away everything that's closer is so much closer and that's not how you see the world with your eyes so that's how the 50 millimeter in the eyes kind of the same but the <laughs> the field of view the angle of view is just massive with our eyes and not so good with a 40 millimeter so people Going into landscape photography, we'll think, oh, wow, wow, I need a very wide angle lens to cover all what my eyes see. The problem is everything kind of disappears into the background. You, you, you have a landscape, but it's so small now in the wide angle because in order to get the same field of view as you have with your eyes, we're talking uh, maybe a 10 millimeter lens. Now, That's too wide. That's fisheye, right? That makes everything <laughs> well, but, look like a bowl. 
but the 10 millimeter has about 180 degrees. Yeah. So you to get that same field of view, the same angle of view, oh, you will need yeah. this super, super, super wide angle lens. Right. But then you have everything kind of disappear unless it's really, really close. So that's the big problem between the wide angle lens and the eye. You, they, they are really hard to compare because they do compare different different properties compare in a different way. So long story short, wide angle lens is not necessarily the solution. But here is a thing. I've just recently um, uh, written a chapter about this and I've now put this in a blog post. If you go to tftdf.com slash WA secret, there's a secret how to make your not quite as wide angle lens seem to be much wider. Now, that means you can go with a 35 or a 24 and make it feel wider than it actually is. Now, and the way this works, and that's a super simple trick, is uh, if you look at that first picture on that page, you see this 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 wall of something and it looks kind of really big and wide and, and, and very large. And the reason is that I'm not showing where it ends. I, I leave the edge oh, out. Oh, you're clever. So now if you scroll down, you see the actual wall, just go one further down and you will, you will go, wow, wait, is that it? The, so you took, a, you took a wider picture, but you cropped it a little bit to cut the edges out. I framed it so that the edges aren't in. So what, what our, that's, that's pretty much a per perception psychology oh, here. Oh, you're what right. Our that's amazing. Mind does. What our mind does is it continues things that don't really end within the frame. So the wall ends not in the frame but outside so we don't see the end. So we make this bigger. In our minds, we oh, continue those lines to the sides and to the top. So in this case, this image feel bigger. has some circles. They're fans. And you crop the left and right most fans. You cut into them a little bit. And so I we know we know what's going to be – we know that that's going to continue on. We know what we're going to see because it's a repeating – Item in the we picture. just com complete the, the missing parts of the picture because we, we know all well, we think we know how far we do it, it in our minds. And all of all of a sudden, you have this almost infinitely big wall in front of your tricky. inner eye. Tricky, tricky. But but if you just go one step back and look at the real picture, then you find out that wait a minute, that thing is actually much smaller than you thought it was. Well, and there's so, another thing I would add because you you were smart. You put a person in there which of course gives you a sense of scale. These fans are gigantic. They're twice the height of the human. But the person yeah. in the super wide shot is just going to disappear. It's going to be too tiny. So exactly. it's much more helpful to get that person as small as he is. When you crop the picture, you see more of him. And the field of view in that picture is, I think that's a 20, I think it might, might be a 35 millimeter yeah. lens that I shot this with. Of course, so nowadays. it's not a super wide angle, but it feels all, wide. Nowadays, we have zooms. So you can bring a, a camera that has a pretty wide range, right? And you can zoom in. But it sounds like maybe if you, should you shoot it wide, then crop it? Or should you zoom in, crop it in the camera? Uh, I mean, when when is your Galapagos trip? You have time to practice. That's, <laughs> Not that's June. what I would say. Well, that's Try why I bought the camera. By the way, in my defense, why I bought the camera now is because I don't like to take a brand new camera on a trip. Oh, yeah, I don't, same with me. I don't know it well enough. There's a lot to learn with this new camera now, but that, that's that's pretty much for, for me. I try to get these things in camera the way I want them. But if you're not as if you don't have that much practice. Um, Try it out. What what works better for you yeah. with with current cameras? I mean, we're talking 20, 30, 40, some, some even fifty megapixels. So you have plenty of stuff to crop. But I'm um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to keep all the pixels that I can get. So I try to compose things right in the camera. Yeah. What a so good he, tip. So here we go. You don't need the widest lens. Yeah. That's what I'm trying what to good tip. to convey. You know, I, I'm going to probably bring a few different lenses anyway, right? Oh, yes. I'm thinking course. for wildlife. Now, the Galapagos is unusual because if you go to Africa, you you know, you bring a long telephoto lens because you can't get close to a lion. So you bring a very long lens. But uh, in the Galapagos, apparently they're not afraid of humans. So you, and get, if you, you can get right up next to them. And if you take a bit of a wider angle and get close to an animal that's not shy, that will be a shot with a lot of impact. Watch the background, though, because wide angle means you have a lot in the shot. There's a good chance that something in the background might be distracting. But if you can get close to one of those puffins or penguins or, or other birds, then go, go low, go close and use a wide angle and you will have a very impactful shot. Chris Marquardt. 
You'll find him at discoverthetopfloor.com. It's also where you'll find his uh, workshops. He does great workshops all over the world. And his book on film photography. I, I trust that that's a bestseller. What a great book that is, if you've ever thought about it. I sure hope so. <laughs> yeah. uh, toying with the idea of shooting film again. It is, it is a lot of fun. Our assignment, Chris, is square. Square, yep. Uh, take a picture illustrating the word or concept square and upload it to our tech guy group on Flickr. A few more weeks left. Thanks, Chris. It's funny you should say that because somewhere by accident, you know, most of my good pictures are accidental. But somewhere by accident, I was in Tasmania and there was this, <laughs> this thing, the wily wombat. And he started walking towards me. And the best picture, of course, I got was oh. wide angle, and he's right up in my face. Look at that. And 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 you're it, right. Yeah. It, impact. It, impact. Lots close, of impact. Close means close means impact. Because I mean, what you're doing is you 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 kind of you you break a taboo zone. You know, you're right. not supposed to be that close for people or animals. Uh, and the, just by doing that, you add some tension, some excitement to a picture, and. Um, and you see that in the picture. I think people, and there's context here now. You see, there's some right. background. You can get an idea what's what's going on there. So. I think people assume that you want to tell a photo to do this, but it really is better if you're close with a. You, the problem is you have to be close with a wide angle. Oh, so some of the real, even in Africa, some of the real good wildlife shots uh, I've seen lately were done with little remote controlled cameras with wide angles. Right. Uh, the animal comes driving right up, up to it. a lion, yeah. and the lion yeah. looks at the camera, yeah. and you get this amazing, I amazing wide angle shot yeah. from very close. I love those. So. Lots, lots of cool stuff. Get an Arduino, get a little remote control car, and you, you're you pretty much set with your close-up close, close uh, line-watching camera setup. Oh, uh, you know, that's unfortunately what I need is a new camera to get me reinvigorated, and then I get bored with it and then go back out. So, well, I was, know, I know some, I know someone who can, you can give you tips <laughs> <laughs> fortunately so do i this was the original 5d I, I took i took that with wow wow yeah oh yeah i love yeah. the old 5d the first one that was that was that was cool it was exciting to get that full frame wow it was like wow yeah now full frame is almost getting the norm yeah all right chris thank you all right talk to you again next week see ya bye-bye take care Hope you're enjoying the show today. The podcast is brought to you by our friends at Epson. You know I'm an Epson fan. Love the Epson. Got the Epson EcoTank printer for our home, the ET4550. Lisa liked it so much, but now I have one at work. Uh, and I set them both up so I know exactly what it involves. Here's why I love the EcoTank. Epson is kind of turning this whole model of inkjet printers on its ear by providing you with two years of ink in the box. These Epson printers, they're based, the one we got, the 4550, is based on the Precision Core uh, engine, which is that industrial engine uh, that Epson brought along. 40 million drops of ink a second and everything. Just beautiful black and white, uh, crisp, vivid colors. You know, all the stuff you want in a great printer. Instant turn on and automatic two-sided printing and stuff. But then they added this tank. See the tank on the side? And you fill up that tank, and it comes in the box with the bottles to fill it up. Well, on the one we got, 11,000 black pages or 8,500 color pages. About two years. And in 2018, when it's time for me to buy more ink, you know, go down to the Staples and buy more ink, it's 80% less. Low ink, low cost ink replacement bottles or packs if you get the big one. I'm not surprised CES 2016 Innovation Awards honoree named the 2016 Small Business Windows Printer of the Year. Small Biz Windows Printer of the Year because it's so awesome. All EcoTank printers, all of them, deliver an unbeatable combination of convenience and value with Epson's EcoTank line of printers. You'll have the freedom to print without running out of ink, and you'll save when you do get more ink. Visit Epson.com slash EcoTank today to transform the way your home, your office, your work group prints. The best combination of ease and value turned to Epson. EcoTank printers, E P S O N dot com slash EcoTank. Epson dot com slash EcoTank. Awesome. Love these printers, by the way. And now, you know, we've been using them. I can't remember when we got the home one. It's been, a, I don't know, six months. And Lisa's office printer now, a few, I'd say three or four months. 
and and just you know no problems at all just love it and i can just go on and on i mean they've added these sheet feeders epson uses now really amazing they work i always had trouble with sheet feeders jamming stuff not these so i use i didn't used to use the sheet feeder for scanning and faxing and copying i do now love it look at the big i like the big boy someday i want to grow up and have the wfr 4640 that comes first of all 20 pages a minute okay that's three seconds a page and it comes with how much ink does it come with some huge amount it's like twenty thousand pages of ink in the box it's incredible epson.com slash eco tank we got nathan staten back at the controls he likes to make me cry Michael's got the day off. Uh, of course, Leonard Cohen, the great Leonard Cohen, uh, who passed away this week as well. And uh, boy, he was just amazing. My, one of my favorites. And uh, a little tribute to him. I don't know if you saw this on Saturday Night Live last night. Uh, Kate McKinnon sang that song as Hillary Clinton, which uh, <laughs> is an interesting mix. I don't, I don't, uh, but I apparently it was quite a tearjerker. I didn't see it. I haven't seen it yet, but it's quite a tearjerker. Uh, 8888 Ask Leo. That's the phone number. Let me mention um, the website because we talk about a lot of stuff and uh, I know it goes by very quickly and I'm sure some of you are scrambling as you're listening and driving down the road right to write down stuff. Please don't. No. The only thing you have to remember at all is techguylabs.com. That's our website, techguylabs.com. Dot com. That's free. There's no sign up or anything. But if you go there, uh, everything I talk about, all the links you want to find, Chris Marquart, he's there. Everything. Techguylabs.com. Uh, our photo assignment, everything. In fact, even the show itself, audio and video of the show, uh, after the show is over, we, we put it up there too in case you miss one. So, Techguylabs.com. Just remember that. Don't you, don't even, you shouldn't have to write it down. Uh, it's easy. Just think of me, the tech guy, in a lab coat with the goggles and a crazy hair in my lab. Techguylabs.com. That was actually the cover of one of my books. <laughs> I happen to have that somewhere. I'll find it and I'll uh, put it up on the labs. 8888 Ask Leo. Russ is in the high desert. Hi, Russ. How are you doing today? I'm great. Welcome. Thank you. I have a question about uh, an older computer. I've got a Vista uh, HP, and yet uh, every time I try to get online with, uh, let's say I'm trying to pay a bill, and it won't accept, um, I, don't, I don't know the proper term for it, but it just won't let me do it. Well, so, um, uh, so you're, okay, uh, does it say... Your connection is insecure. No, what it has it has to do with the browser. It says to update browser. Yeah. So when I try to do that, I can't do it. Okay. I'm on that. I, yeah, you're on Vista. You're on. A, you have a very old browser. Uh, I know Windows XP, Vista's predecessor, uh, topped out at uh, Internet Explorer eight. Vista can't probably isn't much more than that. So the issue, I guess, would be. Um, it's there are a couple of possibilities. One that the website you're using. What's the website you're shopping on? Well, it's a credit card that I'm. Uh, yeah, I understand, but well, it could be the website you're using the credit card on will not work with an older browser. That's not unusual, by the way. I'm surprised you don't see that more often. But it could also be that your browser isn't supporting um, the security that that particular payment system is requiring. That's, I think, most likely the case. Mm -hmm. So we used to use an older version of SSL that has been deprecated. It's not eliminated. It's not incompatible. But some sites may say, you know, I don't want to take your credit card with this less secure method. So that would be my guess. Um, but it could be a number of things. It could be the browser itself is incompatible. One way to test this would be to use something besides Internet Explorer. Maybe go get Google Chrome. And, of course, Chrome, uh, I think they st <laughs> they stopped supporting XP. 
in August. I'm not sure if you can, it'll work on Vista or not, but go to google.com slash Chrome, download that browser, see if you can use that. If not, I have bad news. You're going to have to get a newer operating system, which means almost certainly a newer computer in order to shop on that site. Chrome's not supported on Vista. Never mind. Never, never mind. Uh, for a while, this you know XP has gone out of service. The Microsoft's not updating anymore, and uh, one of the biggest problems with that is you weren't able to use any newer browser on that. But the solution had been up till very recently. Oh, use Google Chrome. They're keeping it up to date for XP. Um, I'm surprised to hear that it doesn't. It's not supported on Vista, since that's more. Several years more recent. Let me, let me check that. Because if it's not supported on Vista, that means Google's decided, uh, yeah, they did it at the same time. Windows XP and Vista. As well as, so you don't feel bad, OS 10, 10 10.6, 7, and 8. Uh, as soon as they were not actively supported, Chrome stopped updating. So... I th you might still be able to download it and try it, and it might fix it because it is a much more recent version of Chrome, even if it's not a newer version or the newest version than the very old version of Internet Explorer you're stuck with. It's a security thing. They don't want you using your credit card on a platform that can't be secured, basically. Uh, chat room saying Firefox is still supported. That would probably have the newer certificate system and be more secure. So try Firefox. That's available from... Uh, Mozilla.org. So really what's happening is the company processing the payment is saying, you're not on a secure platform. I'm not going to allow you to use this because we don't want your credit card stolen. It's for you. <laughs> it's for your benefit. Uh, sorry to give you be the bearer of bad tidings. This is, you know, <laughs> there's a certain irony to this. Computers don't wear out, right? And, uh, you know, the moving parts will wear out. But generally, computers are going to last 10, 15, sometimes 20 years. The problem is the operating systems are not kept up to date after a while. You have to get the newer operating system. If you got uh, one thing you could do on that hardware, if you didn't want to give up the hardware, you could use a newer operating system. Probably not Windows, but certainly you could put Linux on there. xubuntu.org, x-u-b-u-n-t-u.org. That would probably run on that old system. And it, it has the most compa most recent compatible browsers on it. Sorry to be so grim, but this is what happens. Computers, if they don't wear out, they become outdated. Mary, Indiana. Hi, Mary. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Thanks for calling. Uh, yes, I just bought a new laptop for my 12-year-old for school, like a one-to-one -one program. Nice. Yeah, and it's a... Uh, let's see, a Lenovo IdeaPad yeah. Flex 4 1470. It is very nice. I'm yeah. surprised at how nice it is. I haven't bought a PC in like four years. And... They're so cheap, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I got a good deal. Yeah. Now, I would love to have gotten a Chromebook. As you say, it's probably all a 12 year old needs, but our school system doesn't, yeah. can't, doesn't allow it. I'm like, Th ah. thank your lucky stars they don't make you get iPads. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> it would be even more expensive and even less useful. Yeah, all right. Hang on a second. I do have to take a break for the top of the hour, but I'll go right to you when we get back, okay? Thank Can you, you hold on for a minute? Thanks. We'll talk more about computers for schools when we continue. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet and home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, virtual reality, new PlayStation 4 Pro just came out. PlayStation VR, now you can play it in your home. Self-driving vehicles. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the number. Tell you one thing, not going to talk politics. Not going to talk politics. We've, it's done. We're over. Let's just move <laughs> Let's just move on. One of the things that's great about this show, it's the toy store. It's not, it's, it's, you know, everything we're talking about, it's fun. It's toys. Now, it happens to be important toys. Toys that are changing the world. But still toys. So <laughs> well, this is going to be a light, fun conversation. Unless your Windows machine is crashing, then I have no help for you. None at all. Keith in Houston, Texas, Leo Laporte. Oh, I shouldn't have pressed that button. I am sorry. Let me see if I can. You know what, uh, Kim? Hold on a second, uh, Keith. 
Kim, if you can if you can get uh, our previous caller back, I was supposed to finish our conversation with her. She wanted to talk about uh, remember her son's one to one thing. Oh, yep, I blew I hope it. She calls back. I blew it. So call back. <laughs> oh man, I man, I forgot. <laughs> oh, that's mean and rude of me. So we got a line call open back, if you Mary, call, call back. back. And, and yeah, Mary, that's it. Uh, and I apologize, Mary, but we'll get you back on. Meanwhile, Keith in Houston. Hi, Keith. Sorry. Leo Laporte here. Hey, hey uh, big fan. Uh, glad Thank you. To be on the show. Thank you. Thanks for calling. Yeah, I got two tips from an IT pro. Uh, are you an IT pro? Uh, I try to be. Nice. <laughs> There's always something to learn, right? Yeah. And well, that's one of the reasons I love having you guys listen because uh, I'm trying to learn too. So. A couple of weeks ago, you had a guy calling, you know, how to get into the business, and he was asking about internships and yes. stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Actually, it was a father know. calling with his son on the line. His son wanted to get back into IT, or I guess get right. a job in IT. He wanted to know, should he go to a technical school, and, and how he should learn, how's the best. How do you get in the business, your first job? So, for me, uh, personally, I, I just did home computer, like a home PC doctor, but there's also a great nonprofit organization called itdrc.org hmm. and basically what they do is it's a group of it professionals that will go and deploy if a natural disaster happens oh that's so neat. so like when the uh, hurricane hit new york they deployed and for for example they went out to uh, an ikea and set up a network there and and phones and computers so people could contact their loved ones you know if they were out of their homes. So it's a real great organization. I you know, this, a is of, a, this is a great tradition for geeks to do this because ham radio operators have done this for uh, a century almost. And this is so valuable when you, can, when you can help out in an emergency using your skills. So it's ITDRC. What is that? Disaster Recovery Center or something? I don't know, but that's, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Disaster yeah, Resource it. Center. That's it. IT Disaster Resource Center dot org. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I know a lot of other IT professionals, you know, listen to your show, so they can also go there and and uh, you know sign up and nice. participate as well. So it's good for interns. It's good for pros. It's great networking. So wanted to pass that along. Sure. When there's a dis we rely on technology so much that when there's a disaster, a flood like Katrina or hurricane, having somebody come in there and fix the technology that's huge. Huge. Yeah, and they, and they also focus on small businesses because those small businesses, you know, can't afford a full-time IT guy. Yeah, that's Sometimes right. They'll do workshops, so yeah, yeah. I can't say enough good stuff about the uh, organization. Excellent. Well, well, thank you, Keith. What else? What other tips? Um, one other tip. I know you talk about backup all the time, um, but for uh, small businesses or even large organizations, I'd say second to backup is documentation. Um you know, if you don't know how somebody set up a system, yes, it you know if it crashes, if it's not completely gone, yes. it's not data centric. Documentation is everything, and I uh, hats off to one of your sponsors. We use uh, Atlassian Confluence for that. Confluence is fantastic, and they are a sponsor. Yeah, yeah, we use it too. So that's a really good point because geeks like to do the stuff. They don't like to document what they did. <laughs> they like to fix things, but they don't want to write it down. They like to write programs. They don't want to explain how they work. And without that information, you don't know what they did. It's a black box. Yep. I was just thinking that because I was setting up my new camera and all the settings and stuff. I thought, I really should write down what I'm doing here because I'll never remember. <laughs> so very good tip. I like it. And Confluence, again, there's Atlassian a sponsor, but Confluence is a very good solution uh, for that. That's what we use as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's nice to talk yep. to you. Do you work in a big business, a small business? I work uh, for a general contractor in uh, Texas, so we do, you know, build buildings and stuff, so I do the IT behind oh. the scenes stuff. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> oh, that's neat. Yeah, after the fact, you go in there and put the IT in. Yep, yep, right, and, cool. and set up the job site, the ro I mean, remote connectivity, all that fun stuff, because most See, of the, you know, Greenfield operations, there's no Comcast or fiber, right, so you have right. to go and... You know, do mobile internet and all that. And this is kind of my point: is this is it's great time to get into IT because everything now requires technology. And if yep. you're the person who understands technology, man, you got you got a job for life. Well, I think somebody's calling you. I'm gonna let <laughs> I'm gonna let you go, Keith. Nice to talk to you. Yep, have a good one. Thanks for the tips. I completely agree. Now we got Mary back. Oh, Mary, I'm so sorry, Mary. <laughs> 
no you problem. probably thought I you I hung up on you said that evil Leo. So no, you're my favorite. Son. Thank you. So are. your your twelve year old is it got a nice Lenovo Idea yeah. Pad for school. It's a Windows computer, but you have to get whatever they say at the school. So well, yes, but I also um, I like to. He, he didn't like the speed of the school rentals, and, um, you know, I want to keep it fast, and one way I do that is to get rid of bloatware yes. and stuff like that. Oh, you're smart. So yeah. Last time I've done it was four years ago, and yeah. well, I was surprised to see McAfee on there. I thought I know. That was, <laughs> so do, I, I have a two-part question. Yeah. Like, partly with the boat, um, bloatware, and the other thing is I'm going to, I'm setting it up with my me as the administrator, and Good. then I'm going to set a standard He should be a limited user, user or a standard user, him. exactly, yes. Yeah, and I... I'm bound to screw up, like, the user ID stuff, so that's my second. I can tell you more once we have... So we have a 13-year-old, so I know exactly what this yeah. is. And uh, he loves to game. Yeah. But that means he also, uh, you know, what I did is I gave him an old Mac, I put Windows on it, and he's, he's content with that. But it also means that he's always, you know, he's downloading free games, and with it comes a lot of oh, yeah. junk. So that's the very first thing I did is I said, you are no longer an administrator of this machine. <laughs> and I gave him a standard account. And he has to, he's, and it's annoying to him, but he has to yeah. call me. It's a little annoying to me, too, if I'm relaxing and got my shoes off and then suddenly I have to jump up. But it's worth it. Okay. Uh, he'll have to call me over to enter the password. And oh. that's fine. Oh, yeah. Windows 10 now does allow you to use a PIN code. Uh -huh. um, and so that's a little easier. And, you know, if your kid is not, once the kid understands that it screws up the machine and to be very careful about installing and I think he stuff. Does, yeah. He definitely. I was good to start with the rentals. It was nice they to learn. Get it back at the end of the spring. Yeah, really. And they wipe, first thing they do when they get it back, I promise you, is wipe the hard drive. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's good for, once they understand this, that it's, you know, be careful. You can't do, and it's a good thing for them to learn. This is one of the reasons I think one to one programs kind of makes sense. That is, when you go into school, you get a computer of your own because it's how you're going to learn not to download things. You're going to get malware on it. You're going to get stuff and you see the consequences of being careless and you learn how to be careful and everybody needs to know that. As adults, we don't know it because we didn't learn it as kids. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, do I still need a, a special Mac of the un, uh, uninstalled no, no. tool? Un no. Is it naturally uninstalled? No. Until you, unless you activate it. Oh, okay. You can just you can just uninstall it. In fact, okay. the first thing that's the other thing uh, I do. The first thing I get a Windows machine. There's two ways to go with this. One is to just go through the add remove programs. Actually, they call it programs and features now. And uninstall anything that you don't know about. Just uninstall it. Okay. Most of the time, that's sufficient. You can, if you decide that's not enough, you can download a full Windows 10. And the way Windows 10 works now, you can just r wipe the drive and reinstall it, and it'll activate right away. And wow. so it's a good idea to make the those discs the boot discs now because you'll need them sometime in the near future leo laporte the tech guy yeah it's hold on a sec yeah usually in my experience with the most recent machines the problem with Lenovo, <laughs> and there's this Lenovo issue, because in the past, they have put some really ugly stuff on there. Yeah, I, think, I heard about Superfish. Yes. I, mean, I know it's bad. I don't really know much about it. Well, just, I, you'll... I'm it puts, they fixed that, or they don't Yes, do they, were, they were embarrassed into it. What Superfish did, the idea was to replace ads on web pages with their own ads that Lenovo and Superfish would make money on. <laughs> the problem was the way Superfish worked, it compromised the machine and made it vulnerable. Oh. Uh, but once this was discovered, and this was almost a year ago, Lenovo went, oh my God, and that, we'll never do that again. And then they were caught doing something similar with an updating program. I think they've, they've learned their lesson. But this is why, look carefully in the programs and features and... And remove stuff. Okay. Uh, if you haven't activated the uh, McAfee, I don't. I don't. I think the way they I do that is. I'm still yeah. setting it up, and I unclicked. You, Perfect. You know, I did the create or what do you say, custom setup, and I can't believe I had to uncheck like twenty boxes. Yeah. Any of that. Yeah. They should have Windows for kids if they're going to yeah. do this. Yeah. Now, uh, also, I'm at the part part where it says, um, you know, you have your name, your email there, and it says, okay, set me up, register my system using the email address above. This will also create your Lenovo ID if you do not already have one. And I'm I like, hate who do I need that for? I don't want to use You don't want Lenovo ID, no. Okay. So a couple of things you can do. 
Okay. Uh, it may be too late. I don't know. When you first set up the computer, don't give it an internet address. Don't oh. connect it to the internet. Oh. Uh, because then it will let you create a Windows account that is not tied to an email address. Like wow, the old. Well, that is too late. It's and you too know, late. I did not think that. I thought I had to have internet, like to start the you whole. You don't. System. And um, if you don't have internet, it'll say, "Well, you know, we wish you would use a Microsoft account, but okay, I guess okay. you could create an account and a password." Um, so, you know, the, the Lenovo ID, uh, you know, they're just trying to get you to register the computer so they can send you offers via email. Uncheck that box. All right. So if if. As long as it doesn't slow down the computer, no, where and stuff like that. Wait, okay. you know, and I want to make sure he can use his own email when he's doing his thing, and this is yeah. just the admin thing. So. Yeah, I mean, but it's but you know, he's twelve. He shouldn't. Uh, they shouldn't. If they knew he was twelve, they wouldn't be collecting his email. That's illegal. <sighs> and and so they what really the need age? to. What is the age? That Thirteen. To? Okay. Well, um, I know at school they used to have email like this edu with gmail and they yes. stopped that so okay that and the reason google did that is they created an account that is that is a copa compliant the yep. child online protection and privacy act compliant um so that kids can use those okay um and then that you do need for a chromebook you need that because you your account is where your data is and so actually, they i was thinking that microsoft went that way too which is annoying i hate all these accounts i do too um, I don't know. I, you know, if they're if if it's sold as a school computer, there must be some mechanism to protect the kids because it's illegal not to do so. Oh, well, yeah, he would be using one of those edu things, but they kind of they still have to look into that. Yeah, they're okay. If they have an edu address, then it's all right. Okay, all right, but yeah, and I wanted to make sure the standard user he doesn't need my. No, that's exactly the way to do it. He'll beg you, you know, when he wants to do something like install a program, he's going to have to ask you. But that's exactly what you want, and then you can sit down and let, look at the source of it. Michael's always installing stuff from weird sites, third, yeah. you know, third-party games and stuff. Oh, no, this, everybody's playing this now. You know, it's all Five Nights with Freddy's, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's <laughs> versions. And uh, I just, I have to stop Same him a lot. here, too. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. This is, the, this is, the good news is this is what they need to learn now anyway. So yeah. now is the time in a safe environment, like with everything else, that they need to learn it. If the mistake is to, to cut them off, because then they never learn it. Hey, I got to run. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Uh, James on the line from Burbank, California. Hi, James. Oh, come on over to the phone. You're on the radio. Hey, James, you're on the radio. Hello. Hey, welcome to the show. Hey, Leo. Um, quick question for you. I've heard different things about the dark web or whatever. Yeah. And what's, like, the point of it unless you're doing something real in the family? There's no point. Whatever. Yeah. So <laughs> it's kind of... Uh, uh, Nathan uh, Staten, who's with us this today because Michael's taking the uh, day off, has moved over to the uh, George Nori show, you know, the late night show, Coast to Coast, where they talk about the dark world, right? The aliens and the abductions and the weird stuff. The dark web has become kind of code for this mysterious secret stuff on the Internet no one knows about. It isn't. So there's a couple of places that this... What, what the official term dark web means really is the part of the internet and it's, and web is really a misnomer to call it web it's internet the part of the internet that is not indexed by search engines particularly google so when you search for it on google you don't find it that by itself makes it dark and google coined the term dark web to it, for completely innocuous stuff like for instance, PDF files that are stored by universities for academic papers and studies, they're not stored in HTML, in web searchable web pages, they're stored in PDF files. That's, for Google, uh, dark because they can't search into it and index it. So that was the initial use of the phrase dark web. It later began, ex began ex to become extended to the stuff that's on the Tor network. So uh, Tor was created... Uh, Oddly enough, by um, a researcher at the uh, Naval Observatory. Um, and it was created as a way to somewhat privatize, make private, as in, you know, secret, your communications, your, your, your identity on the net. There's lots of good reasons why you might not want to reveal your identity on the net. You may not want advertisers to follow you around. You may be a whistleblower. You might... You know, there's lots of good reasons. And the idea of Tor, it's not perfect, by the way. 
The idea of Tor is your traffic, instead of going from your computer to the endpoint where it can be identified, oh, that, oh yeah, that's Leo there. It goes through a lot of servers, kind of like, it's like money laundering for your data. It goes through enough servers that the, the, the originating point has disappeared. You can still have a conversation, but it has to wend its way through this maze back and forth. It slows it down, but somewhat anonymizes. And the reason I say it's not perfect, and I've, I've interviewed the creator of Tor, and we've talked about this, the reason it's not perfect is if somebody could see enough of the web, they could see all of the different... And by the way, a government generally you know, is the kind of size you need to be to get this kind of thing. If they could see enough of the web, they could figure out. And governments are pretty good at, at figuring out who's on the other end of a Tor connection. Sometimes by owning the Tor exit nodes, the entrance nodes, there's all sorts of ways to compromise Tor. In fact, Tor was compromised significantly by the FBI uh, last year without our knowledge. So relying on Tor for privacy, it's better than nothing. But it's not perfect, and it's important to understand that. So that's often considered dark because, again, you can't see into it. You have to be running a Tor-enabled browser or use a Tor um, client on your router uh, to see Tor sites. But there's completely innocuous Tor sites. In fact, many Tor sites are completely innocuous. Facebook even runs a Tor site. Facebook.onion is uh, their, their Tor access to the Facebook network. And I, I would presume the reason Facebook did that is so that people, you're not anonymous on Facebook. And as soon as you log into Facebook, they know who you are. But I think because so many dissidents use Facebook, remember in the Arab Spring, Facebook was widely used to organize protests, that Facebook wanted a way for people to use Facebook safely in their country. So if you're going to Facebook.onion, you're, you're kind of invisible to your country. Now, Facebook knows who you are. That's how it works. But nobody along the way would, I guess, is the theory. Um, so that's all the dark web is. And, you know, uh, perhaps most notoriously, the drug uh, and illicit uh, uh, selling site, uh, the Silk Road, used Tor so that people could buy drugs and other things anonymously. Uh, and in fact, that was, I believe, one of the reasons the FBI cracked Tor was so that they could track down the Silk Road. And of course, the guy who created the Silk Road has been arrested. Um, so that's all it is. It's not wizards and warlocks and mysterious creatures. It's just the web that isn't visible to the normal tools, your browser and Google. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it, it does. Yeah, I just it's still, uh, yeah, I just... Crazy. Yeah, when you know how to access it or whatever. Yeah, well, if I mean, it depends what people mean by the dark web. If it's academic PDFs, you go to that website and you download the PDF. It, it, Google may not see it. Actually, Google. One of the reasons Google does now read PDFs is for that very reason. Uh, Google always wants to access as much of the web as it can, but it doesn't. It only accesses a fraction of the web. So, as much as you see when you do a Google search, you're not seeing everything. The rest of it is dark from the point of view of Google. And then there are things like Tor where people are transacting business or communicating on the web, but it's not visible to the general world. But you wouldn't want that. You don't want your email to be visible to the general world either. If you're, you, if you're sending email, you hope it's part of the dark web too. Oh, right? okay. If you think about it. That's true. <laughs> so, hey, thanks. Leo. You're, you're welcome. You're I'm glad you called. That's a great question because you hear this term. What does that mean? And it sounds so spooky and mysterious and kind of cool. It's just, it's stuff that's not visible using the tools you normally use. That's all. Let's take a little teensy-weensy break. Lots more calls to come. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, invisible might be a better word than dark. Yeah, uh, you know, Leon Russell and, oh my, you know, I just, I, I've been listening to Leonard Cohen my whole life, but a, a lot lately because they, New Yorker did a great profile on him and uh, and, I, and I knew he wasn't doing well and I, you know, we kind of saw the writing on the wall. So uh, just, just one of our great singer-songwriters, Canadian, I say R loosely, R's as in, you know, my generation. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Dave in Chicago. Hi, Dave. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? I am well. How are you? All righty. All righty. Hey, we got these new uh, iPads for work, and they want us to use SoPad to uh, show presentation to customers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
So, which is pretty nice. Um, but I want to then take it to another level and try to use the iPad more instead of notebooks. And I'm looking for an app that will, where I can write notes and then it will convert it into text that I can cut and paste and put it into a Word document. So you want to handwrite notes and then have the recognition. By the way, yes, there's plenty of programs that do that, but just be prepared. How good is your handwriting? Well, yeah, maybe that's the problem. I don't know. <laughs> do you write like a doctor or do you write like an architect? Somewhere in between. Maybe. <laughs> so there are quite a few. Uh, you'll, you'll, did they give you iPad Pros? Did you get one with the pen? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's good, because the pen means you're not writing with your finger, which means it's going to be more accurate. So, sure. So, and I've, I've tried pen, pen, pen Ultimate. Pen Ultimate's and very pen. good. Yeah, do you like that? Yeah. No, and Fat Pad also. I think those all are right. kind of combined. I'll give, I'll give you a couple of other ones. And this is the nice thing is, of, of all the categories on the iPad, probably... Notepads and note taking are number one, so there's lots of choices. Um, okay. uh, I like Notability. I've used that for years. Um, I'm just looking at my iPad Pro because I have a whole folder, <laughs> a whole folder of these. Um, just just because this is such a such a let's see. Oh yes, enable enable. And every time I turn on my iPad, it has a lot of questions for me before I can look at anything. Let me see what I have in here. Um, good notes is another good one. Notability is probably my favorite. Um, let's see what else. You tried penultimate, didn't didn't like that too much, huh? It didn't. It did recognize, and it's kind of clumsy to work with. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Penultimate. Penultimate's weird. It it can it analyzes it and helps you search within the handwriting, but it doesn't do what you want to do, which is convert it to text you can cut and paste. So that's yeah, kind of a like weird thing. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to be able to write the notes, then go back later and just you know click a button and boom, it it turns it into text, and I can copy it and paste it into Word yeah. or a report. So um, Notes Plus does that. That's seven dollars. I'm pr let me just look and see if Notability. Uh, a lot of these have the ability to search your notes, which means they kind of understand the text. But what they're embarrassed to admit is they don't understand it perfectly. Uh, so they're kind of yeah, we can get most of it, but not all of it. Let me let me, right. let me uh, which means it wouldn't be good for what you want to do. And again, this is going to depend a lot on the quality of your handwriting. Notes Plus is ten bucks, but if you want the handwriting recognition, it's an additional three dollars. And I think that's, of all of the choices out there, the best one at doing what you want to do, which is handwriting recognition. But I don't want you to get over enthused about the potential here because it depends a lot on how kind of uniform your handwriting is. If you write like I do, <laughs> see, most of us who grew up, you know, with computers, we've lost our ability to handwrite anything. Yeah, yeah. Well... <laughs> One thing that I have done in the past is I take my those handwritten notes and I'll just talk it into uh, my my phone in uh, an email and it'll you know take my voice and convert that into text. Right, and that's very good. Siri's very good at recognition, but yeah, this isn't Siri. These phone, are the the, the, the iPad doesn't have any built-in handwriting recognition, unfortunately. So these right. programs have to implement it on them on their own. There's also uh, seven notes and write pad pro they're all about ten dollars that's unfortunate because it means it's and apple doesn't give you any way to easily uh try these without buying them um uh, it's company it's a company iPad. It's company money let us spend <laughs> away and you know you're doing the company a favor because if you find one that really works you can you can tell your coworkers, right exactly yeah uh, okay great yeah so those are at least a few to try i am um, I'm a. I think Notes Plus is probably the best one out there of, of all of them. Okay. Will these be in your uh, your notes? You bet. At the end? You bet. Techguylabs.com. Right. You don't have to write anything down. You the man. All right. Thanks. Yeah, I like the uh, I like the pen or the pencil. I guess Apple Apple calls it. Where'd my pencil go? Somebody took my pencil. Um, it works really well uh, with the uh, iPad Pro. 
Apple's really done a very nice job. It's uh, one of the things uh, that computers don't do very well when you're using a stylus or a pen or a pencil to write on the screen is keep up. We call it latency, where you 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 draw a line and then yeah, it could be just a hair behind you, but it's it's very hard. We're so used to you know the real world where when you draw a line, you draw a line. It's instant, and the computer is has kind of has to see it and register it and put ink on the screen. And sometimes there can be just a millisecond or two behind, and that's enough, frankly, to make you oh, your penmanship get even worse. And it feels it doesn't feel right. Now, if you if you can do it without looking at the screen, then then it's okay. But most of us will look down from time to time, and it just doesn't. It's weird. The, that's one of the things iPad and Apple have really licked. The iPad Pro is is so responsive, and the pencil works so well that it is just like writing on paper. So it's a good choice for that. Um, you know, Windows has the handwriting recognition built in, uh, and a, you know, OneNote does it and stuff. But it's funny, I guess, for, and the iPad's certainly got enough processing power. I, I don't know why they don't. It's not more universal. Not all the apps do it. John in Los Angeles, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, John. Hi, Leo. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Great, great. Hey, I uh, got a quick question about uh, iCloud. Yeah. Okay, so I have the iPhone, um, and of course I have the uh, iCloud, and I had to upgrade to the, the one I have to pay for, for a dollar more. Yeah, they only give right you now. five gigs because, uh, well, frankly, they expect you to pay for it. Right, right. So I share with my uh, with my boys, uh, but I've noticed that a big portion of my space on there is my backup from two iPads and, yes. and my phone. So That's right. Is there a way that I can actually delete yes. you know, what's on the iCloud and yeah. still retain my information? Oh, you want to keep the backup? No, you don't care about the backups, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we won't. No. So what you'll do is turn off the uh, backup on all of those devices first. So there is a backup to iCloud setting. Just say don't backup to iCloud. Now I would recommend that you now back up to a computer. Just connect it up via USB cable. It's faster. Use iTunes. It'll back it up. And then once you do that, you can manage your. It's in the settings on your iPad uh, or any of your iOS devices. You can manage your iCloud storage, and you can just delete the backups. And recover all that space. Okay. So, but do back it up because you don't want to lose what's on there. But you can back it up via wire to your computer, which has more storage for free. And then use the iCloud, that expensive, precious storage, for just that stuff that you want. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. So, um, I should add this to the show notes. My script Nebo. You like this, huh? Not at all. If, not at all familiar with this. So, it has, uh, huh, wow, this looks good. My script, I've used some of their other stuff. Oh, I remember the calculator. That was cool. You could write in, yeah, you could write in mathematics. So let's get these all in the show notes. But this looks, but this MyScript uh, Nebo, new to me. I'm going to download this right now and uh, put it on my iPad. That's pretty cool. It's designed for the pencil. I can't believe we're already to the end of the show. But we'll get a couple of calls in here before I have to go. Starting with Terry in Burbank. Hello, Terry. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Leo, I'm hoping you can help me out. Um, I'm a longtime listener, first-time caller. Thank you. Uh, I am a um, Disney Imagineering artist, and my... Wow, wait a minute. Wow, I just have to bow down. <laughs> We're not worthy. That's got to be the best yeah. job for an artist in the world. It's the best. It is the best. That is so well, my cool. My life has kind of excelled beyond my computer, and for the past eight months, I've been a little challenged. In that I have a MacBook Air, but it's from 2011. Time for a new computer. Yeah. And uh, that's my challenge. Right now I'm working on a MacBook Air and an iPad. Yeah. And uh, I've talked... You know what I really want you to buy? What's that? Can you wait till December 15th? 
I can actually wait till next year because I don't want to buy something right off the press. I want to hear Good. what people like yourself. So I've ordered it, and I'm really excited about it, and you're going to think I'm wacky. It's Microsoft's new computer. It's called the Surface Studio. Surface it, Studio. And it's for you. It is. Yes. It has okay. a pen and okay. with, you know, touch sensi pressure sensitive, very good pen with an eraser on the top. It also comes okay. with a, a knob, a dial, and software that is dial aware that you can use to as a palette selector or uh, as an undo button. In fact, I've seen artists draw with the pen in one hand and the dial in the other hand, and they can use it as an undo. It's a touch screen. It's 28 inches and oh, it 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 tilts down to 20 degrees like a drafting table so you okay. can you can hover it's in a very natural way just like your drawing table you can hover over it draw on it, it has very good palm rejection now microsoft just announced this and um, and they're and they're shipping later this year. I ordered one so I will give you a review but I'm not an artist. I'm tempted to send it to you and get your review. Oh, I'd love it. So what do you do? What do you draw? What do you are you doing amusement park well, rides or I'm actually yes, I, I designed the Dragon's Lair in Paris and Big Thunder Paris. If you go there you can actually walk on, photograph, ride on and uh, experience my attractions in three I different, love this. Uh, and what software do you do you use three D studio? What do you use to design? No, no, no. I actually sculpt three I actually you sculpt, sculpt. It. So I actually sculpt it in the full dimensions, and then it's digitized and sent to the locations of where they need oh, to be. Oh, so the computer, that. you're not using the computer to design then? I'm using the computer to illustrate. What's happened is I'm a collectible artist as well, so I use the computer to do the artwork and illustrations ah. that represent pieces that I'm going okay. to be doing in the future. And are using the iPad Pro for that now, or what do you do now? No, 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 no iPad Pro because I'm not a fan of it, Leo. It seems to be very expensive and very specialized, and it does one thing. And what I'd really like to have, my little iPad, I have an iPad, uh, I don't know what it's called, like the iPad, the, the slim iPad. The mini. I have, and yeah, I love the, the air. mini. And, well, it's not mini. No, the air. You yeah. have the air, yeah. Yeah, and I love the fact that it's light, it's easy, you know, the... the well, I, now this I, is a full... Oh, comp I'm talking about a... It's like crazy stupid. This is a desktop computer. It's huge. Yeah, and I so, don't like desktop, but I'm, I'm really I'm really kind of into a... a I've been looking at the Surfaces, and well, I almost bought the... Sur that's, the um, then, you know, the surface, no, the surface Pro 4 is the notebook yeah. size, the iPad size. It's actually a little bigger. And it has a keyboard, so it's a full Windows 10 computer, but with all of the drawing capabilities. And a, I think a, a richer collection of applications for what you do than an iPad has, frankly. Yeah. What excites me about the studio you're talking about is the problem I had with the Surface is that when I went to the location and talked to them about it, they said if you take it apart, the uh, video card is in the wrong part. Oh, front you're front looking front at the Surface. Part. I know what you're looking at, the Surface Book. I, yeah, I have one of those. In fact, I'm holding it right now. This is weird it's because it looks like a laptop, but if you press the eject yeah. button, the screen comes off, and it's just like a tablet. In fact, that screen is identical to the Surface Pro 4 screen, but you're right. The GPU is in the keyboard. In fact, the second battery is in the keyboard. It doesn't have great battery life without it. No good. Yeah, There's the Surface no Pro 4 is not that way. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's no good. The Surface Pro 4 is not that way, though. It, it, it's, it, everything is in the, the tablet. Um, yeah, so I'm leaning towards the Wacom um, Companion, but the problem with buying it now, I told them no, I didn't want to buy it now. No, in it's fact, if, loud, hot, yeah, if you're looking at the Cintiq or the Companion, you should, de oh, you should look at the Surf. You're the person this was designed for, the Surface okay. Studio. It's, okay. it's designed for you. Just go online and look at the videos and see if it... I will. Yeah, I think that this is this is made for you. Now, mine, I ordered it uh, right away, and they said December 15th. So it's okay. another month. But but I think you're smart if you're not in a big hurry. Wait, no. see the reviews, see what people say. But boy, I bet you... <laughs> call Microsoft, say, I'm a Disney Imagineer. Which is just send okay. me one because we'd like to look at this to see if it would work. They would love that. Okay, I will do that. They made a big deal. They went and they took the Surface Pro uh, 4 to Pixar, to the animators at Pixar, 
and did a whole、mm-hmm. video of them using it and raving about it and talking about it. This is what this is. You're the group Microsoft has decided to steal from Apple. Yeah. Apple has kind of unfortunately abandoned the creative professional.、Uh, mm-hmm. It was a natural relationship. But they, they haven't updated their stuff. And now the new stuff, it still doesn't have touch. And Microsoft. Well, it's like the tortoise and the hare, Leo, isn't it? The hare is sitting there, you know, you know, relaxing. And the tortoise just keeps on plugging. And then the next thing you know, the tortoise. I never thought I would go back to PC. I, I love the way Mac works. I know. Work, I know. PCs are just unbelievable. Some of the things that I've seen them be doing. That I'm, that I'm、yep. saying to myself, it may be time to go back. And I have no problem switching between no, the either two, one because the I pro- learned, I cut my teeth on a PC. And the programs you're going to use are the same. In this, in, you know,、exactly、so you live in the program. So, you know, it's not, you don't even know you're using a Windows computer. Absolutely.、Yeah. I don't know the difference anymore、yeah. because that, this touch screen thing, and、That's、if the I can consolidate it a little bit, I would be much happier because、bingo. to try and make sure everything speaks、right. to each other. Is a little bit of a challenge. The the Apple, creator, Apple, decided, get it out there. Apple decided that we're, they were going to go to the next generation of computing, which would be tablet, and we're never going to put touch in our desktops. The desktops will continue for people who can't do everything they need to do on the tablet until such time as the tablet can do everything, and then we'll kill the desktops.、Yeah. And that's going to、yeah. be what's going to happen. Microsoft didn't have the luxury, they didn't have a good tablet. So, they had to make Windows 10 work and Windows 8, quite notoriously, quite ugly, work with touch. But, they went, but they've gone through you know, the flames and they've emerged with, I think,、mm-hmm. a very compelling product line. And、uh, mm-hmm. boy, now, I got to tell you <laughs> one bit of disclosure on the Surface <laughs> <Okay> . Studio <laughs> starts at $3,000. Yeah, that's what I. Well, you know what? But. You can see that my, my MacBook Air is 2011.、Yeah. So I stay with it if I、yeah. invest in something that can give me a few I, years. I, think, I, I think this is you are the person this product was invented for. And frankly,、yeah. if, I, if I'm、uh, working at Microsoft and listening to this, I'm going f- to find you. I'm going to say, Terry, call the Imagineers. <laughs> Get Terry a Surface Studio stat. You're the right person、yeah. for this. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate that. I really do. That's, that's the thing that I'm, it, it's, I've progressed so much. Before, all I did was use my laptop、right. to、uh, send a c o m m e This is for you. This is for you. Hey, Terry, I, I'm, I'm out of time. I, I got to run. Let me know what you decide on, though. I'd love to hear, but I do have to run, unfortunately. Can you, but it's the end of the show. Time flies when you're having fun. Have a great geek week. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Bye. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called TWIT, T W I T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on. And on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today. And of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon this week in tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great tech guy show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.